where you're you're uh, live on Facebook too, right? We put it on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, and Instagram, but it shows up. So on Instagram, it's probably only going to show up you and Jack. Oh, it only okay. like Perfect. cuts the center, and then everyone else is off. Oh, where did you go? What did you? What are you clicking? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, wait, clicking I'm waiting stuff. to try to mute it here on YouTube so that we don't get feedback. Oh, here, here we go. Goes. It's okay. popping up. Perfect. Good. Sweet. Okay. Cool. All go. right. So we are back, guys. We're doing part two of uh, a 12 part series, it seems like. <laughs> well, this time we're going to try and stay focused. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think we actually did pretty good, surprisingly, until the end there. <laughs> when, when we got on on every every topic under the sun. But. Well, I think it was that last hour that we were like, we should go now, and then we were like, oh, the well, topics. yeah. I mean, it, we fi- <laughs> I think we figured if it was ending, we may as well slip in some some stuff about rabbits or while well, we got time. Yeah. But then then another hour flew by. So yeah. that's the uh, dilemma of homesteading. It's yeah, you, you start with a thought to do one thing and end up with like twelve or thirteen <sighs> things that you yeah jump exactly <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, four parts. Yes, let's do it. We'll do all the parts. <laughs> we'll just continue. Well, I, I say you just take it as it comes. If it escalates into a third part and a fourth part, I'll yeah, yeah. Great information either way. So, yeah. Why well, I, I had um because we, we have like the list that we were going off of. I don't think we hit everything yesterday. There was stuff left for today, and uh, I even had some questions about um, herbs and how safe a lot of those were, and then cucumber because we have wild cucumber and i don't know if that wild cucumber i don't know if it's actually a true cucumber or not i know what it's called no but it's no i don't it's, think it is it's well it's a relative but there's quite a few species let's just start with cucumbers yeah, <laughs> yeah there we go there, there's quite a few different species that are sort of called cucumbers that are botanically all sort of related in that same squash cucumber melon family um, but I believe the wild cucumber that we have isn't the same as the domesticated version. Right. Uh, yeah, they really they look like little loofahs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they end up uh, going quite hollow inside. Yeah, so I believe we have quite a lot of them. Somebody actually in a live did say that they use them for loofahs. Mm-hmm. You, you dry them and then crumble them. Yeah. Little little tiny yeah. tiny little loofahs. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, or if you make soap, I like I used to make soap, and I'd break the crumble the loofahs up to make an oh, okay. experimental soap. Yeah. Well, yeah. Can we add the pictures while we're doing this? I don't. I don't know. Because we, we have um, in one of our yeah. dro- aha, here we go. In one of our drone shots, you can see the expanse of the wild cucumber. It's in oh, between yeah. the wood pile and the, Climbing the dog up yard. All it's, those trees in the hill. And... It's crazy. Let me find it. It's oh, um, it's, a, it's a monster plant. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. And I mean, it's and that's why I was asking, like, I've asked in a couple of groups, you know, like, kind of what do I do with this? Because I don't want to get rid of it completely, but it can't stay where it is to the degree that it's there. Like, it's, it's, I don't know if it's wild a bit cucumber of a really plays nice. Um, I don't think so. I think uh, you can try ripping it out and you might have some success, but it doesn't take much in the way of seeds to have it to come back, take back over. Yeah. yeah. Well, and we're going to be kind of clearing in that area where all that was. So, I mean, we're going to be fighting it for a while, I'm sure. Yeah. Let me, is it this one? I feel like that's too far out. It might be this one. I'm going to try a video. We'll see. Um, are we muted? No, we're all still good. So I love watching in- videos of your farm. <laughs> <laughs> so it's-, it's in between the wood pile there at the bottom right. Yeah, you can see and the, the mat, house. the mat of wild cucumber there. Yeah. That's Going up that hill and then up on the trees. Oh yeah, wow! So, so yeah, we're, there is a use for them. Yeah, we're yeah. we're rich in in wild cucumber. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. So there's a there's a fair bit. Yeah, the, the drones are a game changer. We did. Oh my god, I'm so glad we did that. Even just for planning stuff, because you can shoot it right up and then look directly down and be yeah. like, okay, like where are my sight lines? And like, you know, you don't have to do completely off of the. Um, um, Adelaide images. Yes. Yeah. Like, and that was cool when we did our, um, oh, I guess it's not in the videos yet. I'm so far, I'm so discombobulated with like what I've filmed and what's actually been published. And I don't know. So I'm probably going to like ruin a surprise, but we had had, we had cause to spray paint eight foot circles on the ground. I think and there's some part of that showing do we? Okay. in videos now. Yeah. Um, and it was really cool to see them from the air, right? Because we're like, oh, that's where all the wood's going to be. Like, 
it up. It was really cool. See, and there's other reasons works. to have a drone. Yeah. 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 And, and all things considered, I mean, as far as equipment to be purchased, it wasn't as bad as I was expecting. Like he was like, we're getting a drone. And I'm like, okay, we just sold a tractor. So hopefully this works out. But then he told me the price and I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, I like, don't get two, but like. And it's, it's a very it's good right. camera in its own right. So you can actually just hover it six feet off the ground and use it like a tripoded camera. Yeah. Um, with the ability to do something cool at the end where it like zooms away or, yeah. or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. Wow. yeah. So you have to do the course to like technically know how to fly it and you can't fly it near the airport or the base. And, well, there's a government you know, test they want yeah. you to take and then to register the drone. I've, I've done the test. I have my little license that you need. Yeah. Um, whether or not my drone is registered with the government is a separate. <laughs> <laughs> but you got part of the paperwork. Yeah. There, there, but there's a lot that the um, the drone can do that we haven't even gotten into. Like I think I've mentioned that you can do live streams from it. Yeah. Um, haven't quite figured that one out. Um, we can also get it to lock on to certain things so it can follow you around or it can oh, follow okay. you around and slowly circle around you um, yeah. or lock on to any number of things. Cool. But uh, yeah. yeah, it's um, and, and planned, you know, by the GPS. So you can do like a spiral or some sort of pattern. <laughs> and then once a season, do the exact same pattern or the exact same position. Oh. So you can kind of blend them together and yeah, it's yeah. Pretty, pretty cool stuff that I don't know how to do. Yeah, look at our <laughs> comments section. Oh my goodness! Well, I, I gotta say, like, it was really cool to go into the live last night with twenty five subs and then come out of the live with thirty. Like that was like we were like, oh my god, that was that was really cool. <laughs> well, you know, it was. Uh, I was saying it was nice when we had the same number of videos as subscribers because then it felt like we made one for each person. <laughs> and now we're we're falling behind, and you guys are way behind if you if you're going with that. So. Wow, well, it, it's it's getting to that point. To the our, our videos are getting difficult because we do almost a video a day, so it ends up. Yeah, I saw that. that with our lives. I think we're getting close to six hundred video or five hundred and fifty. I don't know. But anyways, oh it's God. you start scrolling through there to find something or look, you know, and you're just like, holy cow. You have to remember, like, exactly what it was called. Yeah, you got to know the <laughs> yeah. title because if you didn't know what it was called, you're in trouble. Yeah, yep. you're never going to find it. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, like, I've been trying to post every three days, and that's crazy. And then, yeah, I was started, I started looking at frequency of some people's videos, and I was, like, yours popped up, and I'm like, but you posted one yesterday. And I'm like, and there's today. And then, and I went back and I was like, oh my God, this is like every single day, you know, and I'm, I'm drowning over here, you know, doing every, every three days. Well, we're looking at the pacing and a lot of people seem to do every three days. And then we saw yeah. you guys are maniacs yeah. and <laughs> doing it every day. Well, and, and we've actually, cause when we started the first year, we did it every day. Every, like even our a, live days we did. There, every was, there was a couple days where we didn't, but for other reasons, but it was basically. There you go. Patrick, just let us know. We're at 535 videos. There you go. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> um, but we've kind of trying to do a little bit of a, a bit more flexible schedule because we definitely want to make sure we always do the three plus the live. And then we kind of have, it just depends what's going on because we're just- Like this of, time of year, there's lots of stuff to film. There's lots going on. Yeah. So it's really easy it to do a video a day. We really have a downtime this year. No. Yeah. There was always kind of something because in the, the winter time, hard we're for sure. crafts and stuff inside. So that kind of, well, and yeah. Kind of grow room and yeah. So stuff. Yeah. YouTube's yeah. an interesting, an interesting journey. Yeah. It's, I, I'm really enjoying it. I know. And everybody has their own methods, right? Everybody's got their own way that they succeed. And I think it's just a case of when you pick it, sticking with that plan so that people start to understand what your routine is, I guess. Yeah. Um, like, yeah. I mean, we're, I mean, we're, very disorganized that way yeah because we i mean with the things that we have going on um we've been trying to like figure out when we have a day off and like when we can schedule a day off and we've not been successful you're supposed to have a day off ever yeah every day is we the try, same we're, and we're, we just yeah, yeah we can't i mean it's between things that kenzie has and then times that i have to go down um and then when we have like dog stuff going on i mean yeah i mean i think friday is our closest day to a day off yeah but then we end up filming and doing like i mean it just doesn't well and then the weekend know. everyone else has time off and then they they come yeah. hang out here and yeah so yeah. we're you know we're working then or um the worst thing ever as being like a self-employed not having to go out on the weekend person is accidentally showing up at costco 
at noon on a Sunday. And oh, I've done yeah, that once yeah. twice this month. You don't even know it's Sunday. You're like, oh. <laughs> and I show up and the parking lot is packed and there's no carts. And I'm like, panic. No, I don't want to. Hello. Well, you, you, you drive in. I love your videos. Ah, uh, <laughs> oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Are you She's doing very, a garden this year? You too. Are you going to help with the good. garden? Yeah, and you guys can watch our videos. We do, we do. and we're looking forward to seeing you planting some good stuff in the garden. Yeah. Yeah, I got to get a pink garden bed, the large, the large sized. <laughs> a large size. She bed. wants a pink raised garden bed. So I told her <laughs> we can make it. Well, you know what? Our daughter, Alex, her favorite color is pink, and she just planted a whole bunch of pink flowers. So I know what her favorite colors are. Yeah. Pink and purple and blue <laughs> and red and all the colors in rainbow and gold. It's a shotgun approach <laughs> to that answer. Those are all my favorite <laughs> colors, too. <laughs> well, yeah. You guys have a lot similar. What about the animals? Do you like all the animals? Yeah. Yeah. And we live in Canada. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so do they. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also you can live in Yeah, they, they live in Ontario where you we used to live. Yeah. You probably drove pretty drove past their place. Probably. Pretty, much. pretty close. Yeah. But yeah. we'll have to come visit one day. I think it's only about eleven. Yeah. We were talking about that actually today. We were like, well, you know, there's no like Atlantic homestead convention and we're like how we already have to host events like I'm gonna make a for card like, for you guys. Aww, you're gonna nice. make us a card? That would be very yes, nice. I like scribble writing. <laughs> yeah. I love I'm scribble very writing. Good at that. <laughs> I'm very good at that. So everyone told us when we were like, we're gonna homeschool. They're like, your kid is gonna end up so shy and so introverted and not able to like, you know, interact with people. And that's what we got. <laughs> so we don't have any issues with that. Uh, they, they they reflect their parents so it's one of those things if you're you know like ours they love doing videos they love kind of doing the pop in and and they can chat with anybody when they show up so yeah yeah she yeah. um the other day when we were doing well that when we we're doing the seeds yesterday um she takes the gopro and she's got it over and, and she's like talking away to the gopro and she was like you post the ones that you like in the comments and she just like, kept saying it and she's like I was like, oh my god! I'm gonna actually use that footage. It's really cute. It's it's super cute. That's funny. So I think we we got some heavy hitter vegetables as we talked about last time. Tomatoes and peppers probably being the the biggest ones. Things that I would assume everyone grows, or it's a pretty safe bet to say they are. If you're gonna grow something, it's probably one of those uh, at least. Um, but to uh to throw in a, a side thing right off the bat, um, mint and basil. They're not a tomato. No. <laughs> so I know mint is, uh, we've never really grown mint from seed. Right. Because you usually don't have to. <laughs> right, because <laughs> it's still when there. You, yeah, <laughs> once you get it established. So I actually have no idea what the separation distance would be to go to grow it from seed. Um, right, right. But uh, yeah, usually we just clone it. Yeah. And once you get a, you know, if you can get a little pot or, or or start them from seed i had mixed results with that but uh you'll never have to do it from seed <laughs> right. so um, what what prevents awesome. um for example like we have spearmint everywhere on this property like it's amazing because you can be cleaning out the barn and it smells minty fresh because it's spearmint. <laughs> well it's always mo mojito season yeah exactly but then what that obviously is dropping seeds, which are starting to go. So what keeps those from crossing with, if we plant, we don't have any other mints really going, but what if we did? Uh, wait, 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 mint and basil cross? Well, that's my question. They're related. No, they're, they're, oh, okay. They're not, uh, they're not the same species. Okay. Okay. I had a panic there. I was like, I'm way out of my depth. Now the, the basils will cross. But yeah. the nice part about basil, um, you may actually have to, we have the Seed Savers Exchange open because I don't have that one memorized. You're going what to is, the... uh, What is the basil separation distance? Just so we give the right, it should be, oh, of course they don't have it. That's a herb, <laughs> not a vegetable. So you don't have it in the basil? No. Go to maybe a, under herbs, maybe? Is there a herb it's section? I can probably. spell. It's okay. not there. It's not there. <laughs> <laughs> intriguing. Well, there we go. We just found our first sort of deficiency with that seed wow. saver uh, <laughs> right off the bat. Uh, what we do, though, for basil, 
because we have grown different types is you can often get it to go at different times because it's a fairly okay. rapidly growing annual herb, right? So if you start a variety inside and then take it outside, it'll often go to seed. Well, we usually have the problem, to be honest, that it wants to go to seed before you want it to go to seed. So you do a lot of like deadheading, taking, taking. Yeah, I take out. the I take the flowers off of the one that I don't. We we grow, yeah, because we do the we lemon have... basil and right and I call it regular basil, sweet basil, whatever. And yep. I let the lemon basil go yeah. first because I don't use a lot of it. So if I get them growing, I can just harvest the thingies after it goes to seed. So. I, I put that one in and I let it go to the seed and keep plucking all the flowers off of the other one. But I put them basically, what, four or five feet apart so that I can pay attention to it and make yep. sure I'm plucking the flowers off of the one. And then as soon as I've got seeds from the lemon one, I cut all of the flowers off, just cut it right down. And so I can still harvest off it, but I don't let any more flowers go. And then I let the other one go. Um, it's a little risky because it ends up being later late September one. by the time you've got seeds and sometimes it's iffy on whether they um it's not what's mature mature enough. enough usually they do though they're pretty quick once they uh, um, get the, the flower pollinated but right. I find it easiest to do it that way because I only like those two kinds of basil, the, the lemon and the, so far anyways, mm -hmm. and regular. Yeah. And so um, and now saying that last year, I got so many lemon basil seeds, I could probably skip them this year as long That's as they stay way. viable. We um, haven't tried the lemon basil, but we like the sweet basil. We've tried um, the well, sweet basil, obviously, yeah. the purple. Oh, the yeah, purple we did kind. that one. That's the little peppery yeah. kind of thing going on. And I don't, yeah. I believe we've tried the Thai. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's a nice one, too. We've grown that as well. And did, we like that, but we didn't, uh, we didn't end up saving seeds. No, that. we didn't save. That was something we were just trying it and then didn't. See what uh... it was like. <laughs> Patrick <laughs> says, oh, my heroes. It's funny. We always end up talking about Oh, we got Remy. Yeah. Hello. Sorry, I was um, yeah, I'm chatting. Yeah, I'm not paying attention to the comments. I was chatting with my wife and didn't see what time it was. Well, you know, sometimes you got to set priorities and uh, the live stream is pretty high up there. So <laughs> we're trying to find the, the information on the um, on, basils. on the basil, just out of curiosity now, because, of course, now we want to know it. Well, I know it's going to drive you yeah. nuts. <laughs> what, um, what do you <laughs> I've looked it up before? I just don't have it memorized. Yep. Um, but I can't find anywhere that lists it. Is that what you make with basil? What is the thing that you like to eat with basil? Is it pesto? Yes. We eat a lot of pesto. Ooh. Garlic, lot of pesto. garlic, basil, pesto. Mm. Yep. I go for a lot of that. Yeah, she does. Yeah. Like she'll like when she wants a snack, she will get a thing of ba or pesto out of the pantry and then like crackers oh, and wow. just spreads it on the crackers and eats that. And you love. It I like it on. Food. I like it toasted for garlic bread. Ooh, that yeah. would be yummy. We should try a new pesto or things. pesto pizza or something. Mm, pesto pizza is so good. I promise. It's so good. There used to be, that's one thing that I miss, like probably maybe the only thing that I miss about working in a huge mall is that we had a pizza place that did the coolest pizzas and they had a, a basil or a, a pesto pizza that was amazing. I mean, it was like oh. 30 bucks because it was Vaughn, but it was yummy. Yeah. Well, I like the, what the margarita pizza, which is a pretty simple pizza, but I always feel like I'm getting ripped off. <laughs> when I get the margarita pizza, I was just like, I, I feel like I could, should be getting more on this. It tastes good. I always enjoy it, but I, I, I can't, I can't shake that feeling. Jack has a thing about food without meat. Yeah. 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 He's got a thing about it. Yeah. It's one thing when you grow it yourself, but yeah. Uh, there's not too, well, this year we got a little bit better. At, we ate quite a bit of vegetarian over the summer this Mostly year. Mostly because we, because we had so much. Because we had so much, yeah, so much garden right, stuff, right. but. So well, we try to do more of it just to develop the recipes and stuff because the meat, I mean, when things kind of, well, I guess it's too early for doom, but anytime, even if it's like a <laughs> personal issue instead of a broad issue, um, because again, like being self-employed, that's, I mean, we were talking about that today too. That's, that's more often the reason that we'll encounter any kind of shortage. And it's, it's just because of life, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's a, it's a personal <laughs> shortage. Um, and yeah. uh, that's when that that pantry and all the frozen stuff and all that stuff. I mean, that for us was, you know, that's what really hit at home, right? Because you can go through a little like 
you know, blip where you're like, when's the yeah. next pay you know, paycheck coming? But then you're like, well, we have all the food we need. <coughs> we have all the everything we need. We yeah. just like can't go buy drones. Or it's like, a, it's like a whole part of prepping that sometimes people don't talk about very much, right? Yeah. And, uh, there can be other reasons too, where having those stockpiles of food is yeah. good yeah. to have. Mm -hmm. well, it, it reduces my excuses to get takeout, which is not great because when I want it, <laughs> she's like, well, we have this. I'm like, I know we have so much food. And yet, I, I really want Chinese right now or something. <laughs> oh, we struggle with that one too. Chris is usually the uh, the the enforcer. Enforcer, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, we're having squash. Yeah. Eat your squash. Yeah. Yeah. squash you want to have fries? Make squash fries. Yeah. Yeah. We have squash fries at home. Our problem is uh, is sushi. If we're gonna have a problem, it's almost always sushi. Yeah. Uh -huh. Sushi is and the then, one thing that we allow ourselves okay, even it, occasionally. Yeah. Although saying that we started making it at home, it was really good and a lot cheaper. <laughs> yeah, we should. We should. We tried a couple times, um, but now we're like close to the ocean, so theoretically, I could go get actual fresh seafood. Yeah. Yeah. Which so great. I mean, we we kind of um, cheated on it. We I think we used like smoked salmon because we're like, well, then it's still like we're not going to. Yeah, that's that what up. we do too. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, I love smoked I think salmon. What do we do? Salmon and cream cheese and yeah. well, we did the prosciutto one. I love salmon. The prosciutto one. There was uh, so, so that's, it's, a, that's not an crazy. Americanized. Uh... Um, there was a restaurant that we used to go to in St. Catharines forever ago that had a prosciutto roll, and it was like salmon and cream cheese and I think avocado, and it was wrapped in the rice and then the prosciutto. And oh my god, this thing was so good! So we've done that. We've done that a few times. We've yeah, I, I feel like the rice. We never quite do that right. We've done one. It's like a teriyaki uh, rabbit. Ooh. Back to talking about rabbits. But uh, yeah. it's really good. Again, yeah. it's kind of a weird concoction that we came up with, yeah. but uh, it's really good. We yeah. had uh, to, for, for just total, this is total off topic. I know I'm venturing off topic. I, I, had a, I got a lecture last night about venturing off topic. <laughs> 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 um, but no, um, when you sushi rice, uh, President's Choice, or, or um, do you guys have like Superstore, that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah. So we've got, I, I call it Atlantic Zares, which is okay. not right, but it's it's Atlantic Super because, something. Because uh, okay. President's, President's Choice sells a sticky rice that is makes really great sushi rice. Mm -hmm. Is it with the sushi stand or is it in with the rice? Uh, so they sell, they have a, a section in the rice area. It's little bags. They're like, I don't know. Are they a kg? They might be a kg bag yeah, uh, in the rice section, or they sell it in a bulk, more container in where the sushi, where they make it. Nice. Uh, okay. But that they don't always have it. But it's cheaper in. But it's open, so it doesn't last forever. It's not a stockpile right. type item. But if you're going to make right. sushi in the next month, the yeah. getting it at the stand where they actually make the rolls um, is yeah. cheaper. Yeah, you're going to have to tell me how to keep a sustaining population of salmon alive in our pond so we can, <laughs> we can keep this going. Uh, well, yeah, the yeah. rice patty on top. It'll be a sushi well, we, we tried to do the rice this year. It's not going so well. No. It's going. It's an experiment. I think it's going to be – it's that thing of weighing the pros and cons of you can I, – I, I'm a firm believer if you have the resources – whether that's money, infrastructure, whatever, you can grow anything anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> but some yeah, things lost the space heater at it. And well, yeah, yeah. And some things just maybe don't make sense. So we're gonna try it and see how it does because it's yeah. I know it's yeah. a really slow grower. Um, not yeah. sure we can scale it up to the point where we could do much with it, but uh, we'll see. Let me well, see what, what zone is really that What's that? What zone is Ben Falcon? Uh, he's Vermont. I think he's higher than us, isn't he? But is he is he, is he growing some of the uh, the upland rice varieties? I don't know the specifics of which which rice he's actually doing, but I know he's he does it in a patty, and okay. he starts it indoors and and transplants mm. into the into the patty and then lets it flood back. Man, I got questions for Remy. Apparently, salmon fishing is illegal in New Brunswick. R right. Unless it's landlocked. So well, we have to import salmon from like Quebec and then put them in our ponds. Well, there are landlocked salmon. Uh, are, are there? Yeah. Our rivers, our, our rivers are direct off the St. John. Like right now we're getting some of the flooding. There's this one spot in my drive when I go to the gas station to look at gas. Um, that it's like coming right up 
like I can start to see where we might have some major flooding this uh, this year. We won't see any of it on the property, but um, that's good news. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because we used to have big flooding, which was awful. So I'm glad you know we don't have to deal with any of that. Um, but it's like brackish water, I guess, at some points because it's coming it's coming right up from like the ocean. It's coming from the Bay yeah. of Lundy, which yeah, is can, crazy. Uh, and we can harvest the the sea salt right from the right from the road. Oh, totally. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's, that's the thing that Jack's been looking into is the salt. That's, um yeah. And the seaweed, isn't the seaweed good for like if you get the Icelandic sheep and stuff like that, the seaweed is supposed yeah. to be really good. Yeah, and know. then the clams, I guess you can just go like clamming up the beach. I, I'm so excited to get out of the ocean. For it's for the scary. distance we are from the coast, I don't think any of those things make it worthwhile to go for that reason. But if we are going I could okay. see bringing back a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, that makes sense. Grab off the beach. Again, I used to do a commute twice that long every day. So to me, like someone's just like, oh yeah, drive an hour to this. I'm like, okay. You well, know, I like, assume whatever, just a little jaunt. I assume the salt <laughs> thing that you wouldn't it wouldn't be worth it. Um, but you actually get quite a bit of sea salt mm -hmm. out of like a five gallon pail. So um surprisingly, it is worth it. And I think the reason I was looking at it is not for eating, but we watched your um egg tanning video. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, okay, salt, and that's another one of those things. We're like, well, we're on the coast now. Maybe we can figure it out. You can um, and I was thinking, I'm like, it doesn't even have to be good salt because it's just going on hides. Um, but apparently, it's good salt for eating too. So yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, would be awesome. Oh. oh, sorry, um, Remy, I haven't, but I want to. Um, apparently, we have a lot of them here, so that's exciting. So I'm going to go back to uh, um, Ravel to Expand's question, but the, I always say this wrong. I think it's quinoa. Is that not how you pronounce it? Quinoa. Uh, quinoa. quinoa. That's right. <laughs> I did know that. So I have grown it in the past. Now it's um, a very close relative to, uh, is it the lambs? Not lambs quarters. Oh, I always get the name wrong. It's not the green amaranth. It's the one that we, that we eat that grows everywhere. Oh, it's quarters. I same quarters. quarters. Yeah. Okay. I, have a, uh, I think I know what you mean. I can picture. It is lamb quarters. I have a mental block on that. I know where it is in the book, but it's they're they're basically they cross. <laughs> you you think in reference books. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what we found is now I know there are varieties of quinoa that do grow better at lower elevations, but uh, when I grew it, I didn't really find it was super worth it. Uh, yeah. Really, really small seeds. You have a really hard time because of the lamb's quarters uh, yeah. keeping seeds from it without it crossing. And when it crosses, it takes on the characteristics of lamb's quarters. So for us, I mean, I'm even potentially we have so much of the lamb's quarters, maybe we'll even experiment with taking in some of those seeds and see if we can do the same thing. But um, so we've done it. I'm not. I'm going to put that in the the list of. Uh, you'll have to put him in. He won't stop. He won't stop. No. Um, I put that in the, li the the list of experiments that may or may not have been worth the effort for us. Yeah. But I know other people grow it, um, and, and that was earlier on too when it wasn't as there wasn't a lot of varieties that were available in North America because it was kind of like they just kind of amount new thing. with one, and so it might be a little different now. So. Yeah. So that kind of answers that question. But. Yeah, I'm I'm amazed the amount of things. So when we first started looking at homesteading like 11 years ago, um, there were so many things, um, Icelandic sheep included at that point, but you couldn't get. Like they were like, oh, people had them, but like you can't get any. Um, and different seeds and different varieties and just, I mean, even technology. I mean, like some of the water filters and like solar stuff that we looked at. I mean, none of that was really that's available. A huge, that's a huge part. Uh, more so with the animals and the plants that I have a, a, maybe an issue with in some degree, because I think it's to everybody's benefit to be able to get it. Yeah. Um, no, I agree. Yeah. And, yeah, and yeah. you're right. How do I, how do I go down this road without sounding too <laughs> doomy? <laughs> so early. <in> <laughs> but, but it's, it's a case of sometimes the folks who have that stuff aren't really trying to promote it as much as they should for people to do it which probably we never really found an answer to the basil question so i'm gonna have to do some digging because i know right. i have found the answer we couldn't find it quickly so i will get back to you on that um, a separate three-hour live on uh on, on basil, basil. 
It could be interesting. On the frustrations of the world of the internet, not being able to give you the information you're looking nope. for. But if this is a good That's gotten really bad recently. Yes, it has. Yeah. You, My I, God. I used to be able to find stuff pretty fast in, in like obscure little questions. And now. Like we, we are it's people who up. read studies and like scholarly journals. And like, if we really want to go down a rabbit hole, that is what, like, that's where we end up and you can't find. Anything. Well, it used to be just mixed in with other like, results. And now it's just, I guess the one that most people click on, but I'm yeah. not, I'm not clicking on those yeah. ones. I'm clicking on weird ones. So no, I, I know exactly what you mean. Cause I'm exactly the same way. <laughs> it is yeah. so bad. Yeah. And again, the reasons why are definitely in the doom category. Mm -hmm. But we'll leave the doom for a moment. But it's a good segue into this discussion. Is a good segue into probably what I think, and I get frustrated with this one because tomatoes, tomatoes yeah. have to be the most accessible, user friendly. You can have an enormous variety in a small area. You don't need a million plants to have a crazy yield. And yet the, the skills you need to save the seeds are like dirt simple. <laughs> They're like the simplest. And uh, we did, we did a, well, I guess we haven't really done one on tomatoes, but we, we, we talk about it and it usually people just don't seem interested, which just baffles me. Um, <laughs> but uh, tomatoes are people awesome. Often baffle me. <laughs> That's a whole nother. I just, I don't understand most people at all. <laughs> and I don't get it. So. No. So yeah, yeah, the tomatoes, it's, it's uh, I think it's one of those things that we've learned in our experience. It makes sense to grow less varieties, but enough of each variety that you can actually do something with it. Right. Well, and, and since we're on tomatoes, may as well get, get right into it. Um, let's say we want to be seed saving. We wanted to have tomatoes. Most people, they have like a, a beef steak maybe like a, a cherry type um, and then like a, 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 a sauce, a sauce maker. Um, and then of course there's, there's lots more beyond that, but um, how do you, how do you juggle all that? Well, they're very similar to the beans that uh, with one exception, well, with two exceptions, <laughs> uh, which are not very common. You, you only need them to be three meters apart. Oh, nice. So, yeah. Exactly. That's the one thing that's, that's <laughs> absolutely amazing with them. And that three meters, if you were really strapped for space, not ideal, but you could have the ones that you're saving seeds from. If you have, a, if you have a row, right. As long as the ones on the end are more than three meters. Yeah. It should be okay. Basically what it is with most toma tomato varieties, they, it's a complete flower, but one of the pieces, and I can't remember the name of its, eluding me at the moment, but one of the flower pieces isn't fully developed. So it's not very accessible mm -hmm. to insects and the flowers aren't very attractive to insects. So you've probably heard about um, shaking or watering your tomato plants to get them to set fruit. Yeah. So yeah. by doing that, all you're doing is, or the wind will do it too. That's how the pollen gets to where it needs to be to, to oh. create it's that simple. Yeah. There, no, are, I feel there are two exceptions. Though there are potato leaved varieties, which are very few and far between. And so most varieties will tell you on the package if it's a potato leaf variety and they're all heirloom, old, old yeah. ones, because they're kind of primitive in a way. Some of them are big, but they're, they're tough. They need to be like 50 meters apart because they actually have a complete flower. But uh, like I say, 99% of the tomato varieties out there are not potato leaves. There is also some, they're not, they're not really cherry types, but there are some other wild tomatoes. Most of the tomatoes are kind of one species, uh, but there is another wild variety that uh, there are a few cherry like tomatoes. I think a lot of them are newer varieties, but uh, where there have been crosses and those are kind of the same way, but we that's the flavor, but uh, yeah, you're, you're pretty safe with tomatoes if you're getting what, them. What, I think That's you mentioned awesome. yesterday, but what's the mechanical reason for that? That three meters, the insects. Uh... Well, it's just a, it's like a buffer, right? Because essentially those flowers are really not very attractive to insects, but that doesn't mean an insect couldn't uh, visit them. <clears throat> okay. Basically means an insect, if it really wanted to, could access the pollen 
and carry it to another planet. But uh, it's that same sort of thing as beans where they're not very likely to. And uh, tomatoes, they're even less likely to than they are with the beans. Right. So, yeah, it's it's more work for them. <laughs> to get in what there. I'm liking about how like most of these things, unless they're the squash and pumpkins where they have to be like 800 meters apart. Um, it, it, I, a lot of them to me seem to be like they're three meters or they're five meters. And because of how we're doing our garden this year, I'm, like, I'm, I'm really glad we haven't actually built our permanent garden yet and haven't even really planned it yet because this is all info that we need to keep in, you know, like mind while we're planning it. But we're going to do our orchard in these big lines. Um, and each tree, I think, is going to be 16 feet apart. Mm hmm. So if we've got our beans and our tomatoes, like I think I might actually be able to figure out a formula yeah. where I can do like, you know, this plant, then this plant, then this plant, then this plant, and then it's a tree, and then you can repeat it because then you know you've got that spacing. It's, well, that's, and that's where it gets nice with things like, like the beans and the tomatoes. I know beans are kind of funny, but if you kind of go with that three meters, they work really good in like a rotation behind one another, it's right? The, same, yeah. the safest oh, thing okay. really, I think, is to... I say, and I say that we try and do this, is to go 15 feet between yeah. your variety. So you could do a row of tomatoes, a row of beans, a row of whatever beside each other. And by the time you've done those three trellises, you could then do another tomato trellis because you've gotten 15 feet. So you can yeah. do the next variety. And the following year, all you do is bump them to the next trellis. So nice. yeah. <laughs> you know, it works great because you've got peas you've you know all these things that require climbing or support well and, then and it, it works great to just kind of bump them around and delegate an area and the other nice part about yeah. the, bean, potato, or the bean and the and tomato kind of combination is they don't share diseases or parasites right so you can also right. break that a little bit have you guys had to fight blight too much on your property uh we have had uh we had one variety it, was it blight or was that that was no it was blossom end rot. uh yeah the blossom end rot yeah Mm -hmm. okay. So we haven't really had much. Yeah, we've had, and we, that was only it only turned up in our Roma tomatoes. Well, we had one year where we did have a bit of a drought, and we got a lot of blossom end rot. Some varieties right. more so than others. Actual blight, uh, we haven't really had. So. No. Um, no. The we, had it once. we had it. I should I rephrase that. We had it once. I think where we used to live at the old place uh, here. in a really really wet uh, year. On so there. blossom end rot again, like previously they would say okay it's just it's a calcium thing and then more recently they say it's it's a watering issue which blocks calcium so in a roundabout way it's still a calcium thing uh -huh. um and then they say well if you add calcium on top it fixes it now does it or is it just like they started watering better or like does it account for the fact that it is being watered and you know and had well, to that well, so from our own experience and the so the year we had the black the bad uh, blossom and rot issue. We had the drought. <clears throat> We're bad. We don't water things. We try not to water them too much because we want plants to be able to deal with it. Well, uh, and you're collecting we, seed from the survivors anyway, so you're, exactly. you're building some tough plants. Yeah. Now, yeah. what we did find, uh, and I don't I haven't done a lot of research into this, but we got it on a lot of the fruit that were kind of in some stage of development sort of during the drought. And then we got rain and then some of the latest or the, the later fruit didn't get it. So based on that experience, I think it may be more of the water, but yeah. not an expert on that. <laughs> uh, and yeah. we definitely too, we have varieties, like we have a variety called Black Prince that uh, I really like because of the flavor. So that's an example. We usually grow like six to eight plants of it, not a lot, but enough that you can do something with it. But it's kind of... How do I put it? Great flavor, but a bit of a challenge. Not to grow. They just they're they're delicate. They're yeah. The plant, they're delicate in that they they suffer from cracking. They suffer from the end rot more readily. But that six or eight plants will still produce us more than we need for the little bit that we use it for. So um, that's just a favorite. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, well worth it. You the one the flavor, thing that but... we did also have now. We didn't have it last year because we didn't milk the goats, but previously 
we had you were ways. putting the whey from making cheese he was putting the whey on t for watering mm -hmm. in and amounts. in small amounts and so that would have been putting calcium back in so it is possible that it's true well and we also do yeah. uh, with the compost and stuff right because we do compost uh, we compost everything yeah so the <laughs> bones and and stuff from our butchering and that does get it composted so it eventually makes it to the garden so yeah, yeah. all that Maybe. stuff in the long run would help but no i think we we touched on something uh briefly there about seed saving and basically creating your own kind of resistances to things or, or um, um associations with whatever you got going on in the soil um have you actively been doing anything like that or uh, abuse patches i know some people they basically just put tomatoes in the same spot every year on purpose and keep collecting from the survivors and uh no we so we've never really done that uh that being said when we do our rotation because we do so many well i say so many but because we have multiple varieties and you've got them all spaced out when you they never move very far in a year from where they were so they move but they're not moving it's not like it's you know we're growing this field and then we're going over here it's you're moving <laughs> three meters yeah. maybe um so and that being said when we moved here there was already gardens in place so we revitalized one but uh we don't really know the history right we know it had been used but what was grown in it i don't know so and it would have been a long time ago yeah um so not directly but maybe inadvertently somewhat the one yeah, thing yeah. I, the one thing i will say about the seed saving and I say this all the time, and the tomatoes are a really good example of this. When when you start, so you pick a variety, you grow it. Don't necessarily uh, base your um, your full uh, thoughts on that variety on the first year. Like if you really didn't like it, it tasted terrible, whatever. Yeah, maybe discard it. But if you liked it, but maybe the plants didn't do as well as you thought, or they weren't as productive as you thought, or whatever see it out for at least probably two more years because by yeah, the end yeah. of three years it's amazing how the plants because you start to select like the, yeah. the one principle with tomatoes too is always and this is a bit of a loaded thing because it's not like poultry where there's standards but kind of learn the tomato variety a bit and what you should be looking for like you know what would make a aroma tomato as far as shape and size and that sort of thing and always save your seeds from the best fruit, which tomatoes are great because that's super easy to do. Yeah. Right. Don't, don't save it from ones that are, you know. Well, and then crap. one, I'm, I'm going to use our Scotia tomato. One of our viewer comments there, just well, as an it, example. Yeah. Uh, so we have a, uh, we've grown Scotia tomatoes for 10 it was probably, we, we were trying to figure out when we bought the seeds. It was probably at been... least 10 or 11 years yeah. ago. Wow, but we bought awesome. the original seeds. And so over the years, we've selected what we liked best about the Scotia tomato, right? I love the flavor. I love that they're perfectly circular and look just like right out of a grocery store. The prime, gorgeous tomato, perfect for slicing, great for juice, everything. But I like them a little bit bigger. I can't stand yeah. little plum tomatoes. Yeah. <laughs> so for 10 years, we've selected the ones that looked beautiful and had the great flavor and were perfect like scotia tomatoes we've probably but we've slowly them. increased the size because those are the ones that i like but we've done that yeah. we, we we analyzed it when the question came up because we had a we, viewer say that our it was it was a great comment but they said that they thought that they'd maybe crossed with something because they were too big to be scotia tomatoes but this was right. they're your tomato now that's yeah. the hickory croft tomato yeah but like you say we, we selected for bigger we the truth is we didn't we just selected the nicest ones yeah. and over time size was one of the things that you just like happened. those ones <laughs> i will also i will also say the vigor of the plants um is insane because they are yeah. they're a, they're a yeah. they're a determinant and they're crazy <laughs> oh yeah if you get your hands on some scotia tomato seeds they're amazing tomatoes yeah. absolutely yeah. amazing. yeah well and there's the um i guess it's more of a philosophical question do you avoid problems at all costs or do you power through especially with the seed saving and then just uh you know select and and build build uh, alongside something oh that's a loaded that's a without mentioning like chestnuts well, you know, that, would, that would tie in with like what you'd said about your black prints the black prints are horrible 
They are, they want to die. They do not want to survive. But because they're so good, we've soldiered on and we've been growing them for 10 years and still haven't gotten a perfect tomato. I think think the longer answer to that, you you are right. Um, I think to some degree, you never get the perfect anything. That's kind of my opinion. Um, But I think it depends where it is. Like the tomatoes are a good example of there's varieties that have come and gone by the wayside because we didn't like something about them. And we're getting to the point, we did some trials last year with some new varieties, which we hadn't had anything new for a few years, picked up a few more that we like and a few more that we aren't going to keep with. But I think the soldiering through it depends on how easy it is. So the tomatoes, they're so prolific they're basically they're so easy to grow they're so easy to save seeds you don't need like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of plants to, to do that selection and you don't have to worry about inbreeding depression with them that's the other thing right you could take one plant and just save and, and just save that. seeds from it every year if you wanted i mean maybe on a cherry or smaller tomato that'd be productive enough to do something but you could actually do that so in a case of, of a an organism or a plant or an animal like that, we tend to just soldier through. When they're more difficult, that's when we sometimes weigh the pros and cons. Yeah. I was going to say, um, uh, Ravel to Expand had asked a question and about yeah. the perfect, um, um, what do you, landscape cloth? Isn't that what you're, I think that's what he's meaning about that mm-hmm. landscape cloth that you can put down. Yeah. Uh, I don't have. know your guys' experience with it. We tried it one year didn't work too um, well. and ended up ripping it all out and using it as our paths in between and mulching <laughs> yeah we were too windy to put down anything well, no, no we we tried we did landscape cloth and our experience was that um i did not probably put it down correctly i mulched on top and then when i was putting my things in because i had to cut because i had to cut it within yeah. two years it was as if we didn't have it at all and then we, if we needed to remove it, we were, it was a huge job. I mean, it, oh my goodness. Yeah, so I, I mean, all the mulch and you know what we found yeah. plants grew right on top of it. If you put mulch, yeah. from the the ones you don't want are just like piece of wood. Perfect. It'll, and then even like, if you don't put mulch, it'll collect little bits of debris yeah. and it'll hold just enough soil there. And then something that can get the roots through the stuff will grow. And I'm garbage at weeding. Yeah. Like yeah. they hit a certain size and I'm just like, well, I guess the garden's fucked this year. And I, I, never did. Did. <laughs> like, I did find it very useful for the paths in between. If you were sticking with a garden that you yeah. were never going to move your paths, it was really yeah. great yeah. because he put it down and we just kept mulching on top of it and it worked great. But that, uh, that, but being, it, that being said, we found cardboard. Cardboard and, works uh, just as good. Cardboard. Yeah. Yeah. I've saved all our cardboard. Well. Yeah. Yeah, from the move, I've saved all of it. Um, with the stuff that I'm not, well, I'm, I'm burning some of it. Because our wood isn't seasoned because we didn't get it inside, which is part of the reason we're doing all the stuff. So every time it rains, it's all wet. And I'm just, have I done anything about it? No, I'm just burning a bunch of cardboard and I'm going to get a chimney sweep because I'm like, <laughs> that's not good. That's not what we do. Um, hope our insurance agent isn't watching. Um, <laughs> it's not that much. And I don't burn plastic stuff. Like, it's... it's <laughs> I'm doing it safely. See, this is why I get nervous. Jack's always like, why are you nervous? And I'm like, because things come out I, of my I mouth. I admit like, to insurance I, fraud. And- <laughs> <laughs> I, I told them that I get regular <laughs> chimney sweeps. I didn't say why. Um, you know, the the other thing I was going to too, because uh, we were talking about the Scotia tomatoes. I don't know if, um, if uh, where where'd the comment go? Oh, uh, yeah. Wow. They just kept um, on going. Uh, yeah. Ravel to expand. It, it, uh, oh, uh, real, oh, really? They used to do them at the farm. I'm wondering if he's talking about the Scotia tomatoes. Um, I mean, honestly, they're an amazing tomato. I always say, and we, we did a prepping video about tomatoes or something. And I said, if I could only choose one tomato to survive off of for the rest of my life, it would be the Scotia tomato. Yeah. It's kind of a good all around. It just, you can use it for everything. It's, yeah, it's, a great I, I like, I like that kind of thing where, I mean, cause I get, I get nervous relying on different varieties. And I mean, we, we do legitimately between onions, potatoes, and tomatoes that makes up a, a massive amount of what we're actually eating as far as veggies wise. Well, um, now that we've been dehydrating the peppers, a lot more of those too, but that's a big, big deal. In our about, that's the big thing about, uh, cause how, how many pounds of tomatoes did we harvest last year? Uh, we, we, 768 pounds of tomatoes. <laughs> 
That's what we harvested last year. <laughs> that's, that's the nice thing about, again, I can't, I, I really, I know everybody, I'm all about squash, but <laughs> I honestly think tomatoes are tomatoes. one of those power, powerhouses. But right? you know because what? When you go down, like we make all of our own, like I said, I, I did this as an example in our prepping video. I make my own ketchup. Well, if you go through one liter of ketchup a month, that's 12 liters and that's two batches. Um, no, sorry. That's six batches of my recipe. And my recipe calls for 12 pounds of tomatoes. Wow. So you're almost a hundred pounds of tomatoes just to make the ketchup. ketchup. And then we do barbecue sauce, pasta sauce, tomato juice. It adds up. Yeah. Like it's amazing <laughs> how fast it adds up. And that's where we say about the one thing that we always kind of say to, to people is, plant enough of a variety that you can make something out of it because that that's where our, it's if you have the space i mean i know sometimes people don't have the space but it's yeah. like just choose one if you only have a, a, a 20 by 20 foot garden then just grow roma tomatoes and make pasta sauce you yeah. know I mean, Yo, like, we love our pasta sauce yeah you know choose something because i think that's the hardest part with tomatoes is you Thanks. have to grow so many to make by, by so many, like we grow basically 10 to 14 plants of a variety. Yeah. And then that allows us to get enough ripe at one time to make something. Well, we always talk yeah. about simplifying and paring down and, uh, and, then I and, and that's part of like, part of the seed saving thing is because that's going to help us, you know, <laughs> make us make decisions. Yeah. Uh, unless you give us permission to, you know, grow every type of tomato or bean, which apparently you have. Um, so, <laughs> as long as you've got the space <laughs> to yeah. do it right and everything's fine yeah but we yeah. we always end up planting more stuff anyways but we always plan on we're gonna do like one thing in a big way because then we can just process it and do lots of things yeah. with it and uh you know get to really know that one plant so like we want to do uh jalapenos because we just use a buttload of those um, that's going to be a whole topic we use tonight. a lot of we use a lot of pickled jalapenos yeah um and uh for tomatoes same like the the standard stuff sauce tomatoes being a big one um and they produce a lot so the hope is that we'll just manage to produce a, a stupid amount of that um and uh and be able to process it and kind of learn about it but likely we'll end up planting lots of things anyways but um real quick i gotta uh lewis your comment like i laughed because yes i mean literally we could have done anything we could have made any decision about that wood and it would have been better than what we did which was nothing um it was purely self-sabotage and i don't know why i do this with firewood all the time it's like i love to be miserable and i never do anything about it so um the next question um is that ties right in so we are this year we're finally like we are breaking that bad habit of being terrible people with wood and we are changing our ways we're changing our ways and we've got a video coming out about it i'm super super stoked we're actually going to do a premiere so for i'm going to i'm going to do a let's do a spoiler a spoiler because for people that are in here and i'm very very curious because in your last video you started the town the towers yes yeah, yeah. So, so do you just throw wood into the center after like because so, you're going around the outside Kinda. <laughs> some people gotta... some people do that um you don't you don't go too high and then throw it in the middle because then you're just asking to start knocking off the the wall you yeah. go up a bit and then you do the middle and then you go up a bit and you do the middle okay so the just... middle still has to be all pretty organized too though right like, yeah it, it does some so... people just fire them in there all your weird okay. pieces that's like the place to throw them um the better way the more proper way is you're supposed to lean them up against each other all towards the middle and then all the outside is leaning kind of towards the middle also and then it's yeah. supposed to just kind of solidify itself everything all yeah. the weight going it all in. goes in I've, um, I've seen them in, when we drive around i've seen people with them but i always wondered yeah. like what is, what's the we're so excited it's it's so cool so the one is like 80 percent done um and the next part that i have to film for that video is the actual like nuts and bolts how to actually do this because i mean when we were filming the first bit of it um uh, which some of which ended up in a couple of the videos um because the footage was good and i had it and i was like okay i need to do a video um but yeah we are going to do like nuts and bolts like how do you create this and like the issues yeah. we found and um and we're going to premiere that because like the last time we did a premiere we had so much fun it was just, it was yeah. awesome. And, you know, then I asked in the group and I was like, I want to do them all premieres. And then everyone's like, okay, hold on. <laughs> Don't do everything as a premiere. Every You're video, crazy. every three days um, is a premiere. So I've been waiting for something good enough. And like, let, let me put it this way. I watched this, this video. We've got about 11 minutes of it so far. I watch it every day in premiere. 
because I'm so excited. Like I'm, I'm very, I'm very excited. Oh, that's awesome. the best thing I've ever created. Now, now, now we're all excited. So you yeah, you really set the bar high. Yeah. Yeah. Pile done. I'm very excited. I'm, well, yeah, and it, it went from, and that's something that was funny because we were like, we're gonna, you know, stack our wood up, and then we were like, you know, Jack's like, let's do one whole thousand, and then we were like, hey, which we're I think is a whole house. I think if you're doing the German, I don't know. <laughs> I think Holzhausen is the plural. My German's not. But no one says Holz, Holzhaus. So, but I think that's actually the way to say it. But. Yeah. but we're probably doing three and it's probably not going to be all the wood. So um, we're really, yeah, we're really, really excited about it. Um, I had to pull wood off of it, though, to bring inside the other day, which felt really wrong. I yeah, did, I and, did not like I, doing that. She told me after the fact. I was I was pretty upset. Is that why you didn't bring it inside for me? I'm like, I'm like <laughs> fidgeting and getting them all lined up perfectly. And she just like, you know, starts Took grabbing some. them off the top. I, yeah. I, I actually did. I took it from the other pile. I did. I promise. <laughs> oh, now we're backtracking. Now we're backtracking. Yeah, yeah. Uh -oh. so, if, if you, you look those up, um, you, you'll see things about that they have benefits that they you can fit more wood in a space or it'll dry it faster. I've looked into both of those claims and I have not been convinced by either of them. But <laughs> like I said in the video, they look really cool. So we're going to do them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, cool. We got to look at them all year. So I yeah. think, uh, you know, it's out of, right out of that night, our uh, windows and you're going to see it from uh, lots of parts of our property. Yeah. Um, it's just, it could be a cool art piece or it could just be a stack of wood. So. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm, yeah, we're really excited. We're doing so many things. I mean, it's just like, we have a hundred chuckers showing up in two days. Yeah. I think I talked about it yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and we're both like ripping right. apart and redoing part of our barn as a temporary thing. And then I'm also totally changing and adding on to a garden shed that we have um, at the same time. So it's just like, there's, there's a lot going on. We're really excited. And then somehow we have to do the garden. Like, yeah, we yeah, well, yeah. haven't started anything. Talk, <laughs> so talking about, and um, you've decided to make your whole life public so that we can all watch and see how yeah. you do it. <laughs> yeah. Which honestly has been like the, the best possible motivation ever. Cause normally I get 80% through something or 90 and then I don't do anything about it. Like when we were selling our house last year, I had to finish the last 10% of like at least a dozen rentals. I had all the stuff for it at least, but yeah, I mean, purchased everything. I didn't finish <laughs> anything, like not a single thing. So I'm really yeah, trying to like yeah. break you know that. that well, we brought all the stuff from our last place for uh, screening all of our windows at our last house. That yes. uh, that was a project that for a couple of years did not get done. We yeah. just kept the windows closed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We had all the stuff and we just never, I mean, yes, Princess Auto. Man, I love Princess Auto. Like we, so when we got here, we drove the, the 1,500 kilometers and day three that we were here, I blew a tire. Oh, like just like on the driveway, just, you know, my tire pressure thing goes off and I'm like, oh, it's probably just, you know, it's probably just low because I'm an idiot off road. I'm like, whatever. So I go out and I can hear the tire. It's like, and I'm like, I'm in trouble. Oh no. <laughs> um, but I went in there and it was just like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I need to change a tire. And it, it was, it was great. They were just absolutely fantastic. You know, it wasn't yeah. like, ma'am, where's your husband? You need an adult. They gave you 90% like, like, off me. on, on a, on a bottle jack um 50 because i was having a bad day yeah they, they they yeah they took into account your store i don't know if they would have done that for me she says that it's just like princess auto and this just like a, a really, really good nice. outfit i believe he was nice yeah. to you i looked like garbage that day so there's you can't even <laughs> you can't you can't don't even yeah. i probably hadn't showered in like a week i hadn't slept in two weeks well people are into all kinds of things i don't know <laughs> yeah <laughs> homeless looking people like i don't know, I don't know. I don't know. yeah so I, yeah. I generally, when I go out, I try to look as unapproachable as possible. That's like my goal in life. Like, I just, I don't want, I, yeah. It's like, don't speak to me. It's so fine. Getting, getting back to vegetables, at least a little yeah. bit here. Not my um, lack of hospitality. Hospitality is yeah. fine. My lack of, lack of, what, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not gonna stop. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna stop. See, this is why I get embarrassed <laughs> and nervous. Oh. So the um, we talked about changing, you know, varieties over time, um, which you know, if you're not paying attention, can happen. We should make a, a homestead challenge. This would be a ten-year challenge. So you got to be in it deep. But uh, trying to turn aroma back into a beef steak or something. So we'll see who can successfully turn something into something, some big genetic some challenge. plan that it looks nothing like it, and we'll see who can get there first. <laughs> 
without the honor without system because you could just cross it out. But I was going to say with because you could potentially do that pretty quick if you did that. Yeah, you, if you cheat. Yeah. <laughs> well, how long? How long you? How how long and how drastically you can change something just by making personal choices, basically. Yeah, yeah. I would, I would keep it to a tomato. Okay, a tomato. Yeah, yeah exactly. it's a it's a numbers game too. Like the more you do, the more likely you are to find a weird one that kind of matches. So yeah. I find the, gen the the genetic stuff is really interesting to me. Yeah. It's, Super. it's fascinating. You know, well, like the nurseries who grow, you know, thousands of something just to look for weird stuff, mm -hmm. and then they put a name to it and sell it for the next yeah. thirty years. Yeah, they're like, here, here's yeah. this thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what's amazing about plants, right? Because <gasps> this, this goes back to the discussion about, um, you know, do you just plow through it or not? Because it's yeah, it's yeah. totally when something can reproduce that much that you have the potential to to do that kind of selection, then it's worth it. When yeah. I always yeah, say yeah. like going to livestock because some of them are really slow. It's like cows. Mm. Oh, it takes forever. Exactly. You could you couldn't do it in your lifetime. <laughs> pigeons, pigeons are very fast. Yeah, multiple exactly. generations yeah. a year. Change yeah. the rabbits so yeah. fast. Well, yeah. and even, even chickens, right? They're slower than the pigeons or the mm. rabbits, but yeah. still yeah. fast. Yeah. By, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, like, it's like that saying: you want on the vegetable side of it, you want vegetables that want to grow like weeds, where they just do well. Yeah, they just go. Well, you know, you forget yeah. they exist, and they are producing things. I guess there's, that's why there's less like. Um, uh, trilliums in the stores that they're, you know, that they've created because it's just, you know, the investment. Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. yeah. Seven yeah. years. I mean, that's, that's insane. Yeah. Um, we love Lee Valley. I've never been into a Lee Valley, but I love the catalog and we I were, love what arrives we in the mail. Online. I think I got so, a, a scythe. Yeah. You got the scythe from there. Okay. We um, had like our last property, the grass was ridiculous and it would get to waist height. And, speaking and of growing of like eye. weeds. And uh, I, I'm just, we, we had, we were completely unprepared and we didn't have the proper equipment. We didn't have a tractor. Um, we went through a winter with a, with not, not even a snow shovel. It was a, a garden spade yep. um, and with the drifts and, and it broke. Um, yep. So we were, we, we weren't were prepared to have a mortgage. We were forced by life things yeah. that's sleeping over on the bed there. Our property was trying um, to kill us and we weren't putting up much of a fight. Yeah, no, we were um, like, okay, <laughs> this is how we go. All right, perfect. Like, Yeah, so I bought a scythe and I'm like, I, I watched some videos. I'm like, okay, look at that. It's like butter. Yeah. They're just they're just cutting through this and it's just falling <laughs> down. And I get this scythe and it was horrible. I, I think I nearly passed out from heat exhaustion. I got like a couple feet forward. Yeah. Um, and I, was, I had visions of like doing acres with this thing. <laughs> Have you ever watched, and I can't remember the name of them, there's a channel on YouTube where the whole family cuts its... Oh, and they do it in a row together? Together. I've seen oh, I've wow. seen that. It's um, quite... It, yeah. It's what interesting, but that? it's also mesmerizing to just watch, watch it them. because they and all it's just, have... Yeah. Yeah. That, that's from a lot of practice, I'm guessing. Well, and I've, I've watched... And the like, okay, like from, from the Valley as well. You have to do the angle just right and... Uh, I watched it all and I'm like, okay, so it's just, I sharpened it. It's really good. And I just got to turn my, my waist more than anything and keep the angle. Yeah. And it was not happening. I was swearing and I, I, yeah, put it down and didn't pick it up again. <laughs> I tried, but I'm, I'm just too short, which is a problem. And I find a lot of the tools like that. I have an extra problem because all of my height that I do have, which is not very much is in my torso and not in my legs. So it is an issue. Like even the weed whacker that we have, um, I've had to consciously go about learning how to use it with both sides, which is really hard because I have a bad shoulder um, because I have to switch so much because I have to hold it out at this stupid angle. I mean, it's, I struggle with something. Well, like I, I invented a, a weed whacker and I'm like, well, why don't you just put like a, a blade on this thing and spin it? And then I found out after that it already exists and they're called brush cutters. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Which are awesome, by the way. Yeah. No, yeah. We, we like ours. You got like yeah. the double handle one and you, you, you swing it that way and it's like also strapped oh, yeah. to you. Yeah. I've, I've got, uh, I've actually got to go this weekend and that's one of the, uh, one of the jobs to do one of our, uh, well, two of our past years. We, we before we sold our tractor, uh, we did brush hog everything. But yeah. uh, grown back up before we got it fenced, it grew back up in, in blackberries, which we don't mind blackberries, but we don't need six acres <laughs> yeah. of yeah. blackberries. Yeah. So, um, and once it gets big enough, the sheep won't go into it, right? But yeah. if we yeah. knock down what's there now, 
they will eat it when it's young and we'll have a pasture. Well, it's like with the, the burdock at our last place. They say, um, well, don't, I asked like, okay, well, it's different ways of killing it or getting on top of it. And uh, they said, well, don't, because you can make a, a really nutritious tea out of it. I'm like, I have eight and a half acres of burdock. I don't know how much tea you think I'm going to be drinking. Yeah, yeah. And, and we're talking like stocks like this. Like we we hired some friends of ours to come help us with this, um, clearing that property. And they actually ended up using chainsaws at one point for oh, the burdock. Wow. It was ridiculous. And yeah, James, I missed something. I is, think. This, is this an OnlyFans joke? I don't know. Well, I think o so. Only farmers. Now, actually. No, that's the, the one that James is saying. Uh, well, oh. I to see if that was who it was that was going across the. Doing uh, okay. The okay. I so I, I, yeah, I went in a different direction, which is funny because I was talking about that this morning. So it was so this morning it was like two degrees, and then it got up to fifteen, and it was sunny, and then it was windy, and you know all the things. And I was laughing about it because I was like, "Is this the homesteaders' version of like a, a strip show or whatever? I don't know what the fuck you call it. I've never been to a." I've never been to a strip club. Um, but I was like, honestly, like you start the day and you are so bundled up and then it's like thing, 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 thing. And I don't know, I figured we should make some kind of video like that. And I think it'd be really funny. <laughs> yeah, all your you clothes know. at different different parts of the property. Yeah, like just, you know, because you do, you end up losing so much. And then we're like, why is there so much laundry? And Along with like, all the well, pliers and screwdrivers. Yeah. And gloves. Yeah. Gloves are another gloves, yeah. Yes, the gloves, my God. And the hats, like, so I buy hats. I love hats. I buy so many hats and he just takes all my hats always just takes the hats. I mean, like probably two thirds, the hats you wear are not yours. Yeah. Well, I don't want to get, and then I have to just keep like buying my, my forehead's getting bigger every year. I gotta, I gotta be careful. <laughs> this is true. Yeah. Oh, that's that's yeah. very interesting on the uh, avocados there. Mm -hmm. Well, that's mm -hmm. a good example. Of, yeah. Yeah. You can do pretty amazing things. Yeah, but you've got to find that amazing. Well, I think was it James earlier up asked about the whether uh, this this challenge includes hydroponics and. Uh... Oh yeah, man! I want to get into hydroponics so bad. Like, and it took me a long time to go from like switching my mindset of that just because I don't know. Like the first time I ever heard of hydroponics, it was like from some you know super stone fifteen year old who was like, "Want some hydro?" And you know, like I was like, "What the hell is that?" Like, you know, you, but you tell me if you know what it means first, and then I'll tell you if I'm going to buy it. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that I mean, like, I'm really interested in it, though because I've got as much as <sighs> in our self sustaining journey. I get really nervous about relying on my ability to keep a garden alive. So there are certain things <laughs> well, that I want to always grow, even if it is year round. And I, I worry that I'm being stupid. Like I'm like, I want all of our herbs and our lettuce to also be growing in the house always, mm -hmm. because that's, I want to devote a... the space and, and I want to get used to it. Basil and... doesn't like to live outside for us. I, I've never kept basil alive outside. And I have spent like, I'm not even <laughs> lying hundreds of dollars at this point. And it's, it's insane. Um, so we want to do that as well. And I, I want know. to do some of the hydro stuff because I mean, I've seen some of Jack Spirico's videos and other people who've been doing it. And it, it seems like it's something that I can like apply a formula and some procedures to, and then maybe not fuck up. So I've only played with like an ebb and flow yeah. table kind of system. And that's, Absolutely. that's for me, it's like a halfway point between like a soil medium and like true hydroponic where if the timer is off by a minute, everything dies. Um, you know, it's, it's going to soak it up and absorb it and take a while to dry out and you can actually put some, some stuff right in there. Yeah. Um, and it just floods the whole table and then, <laughs> and then it drains it out. Kind of like what I do with seed starting. I'll, I'll fill the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. And let it just yeah. soak up that way. So. Oh, exactly. I've got some, uh, I guess I'd, I guess you'd call it aquaponic ideas because not so much for the fish being food, but for humans, but, uh, using the fish to grow the vegetables indoors because yeah. in Canada, we can't really do it outside year round. I mean, yes, you can grow yeah. fish outside year round, but, um, but then maybe. Tilapia so you know, or? No, I'm Blue going water. smaller. It's going little fish. I, oh, okay. Guppy. Yeah. He's doing guppies. Yeah. And the, reason yeah. For that, the reason for that is because. Basic same, guppies. Well, but, but space wise, <laughs> they don't take a yeah. lot of space. They're not hard on the system. Like they, they produce yeah. waste obviously, but if the plants are using some of it, they don't produce so much that you can overload your system. But yeah. I'm also experimenting. This is a little spoiler alert uh, as feed for chickens, because yeah, in the winter months, this is that trying to break the dependency of 
you know, we don't buy formulated chicken food right now. We just do a sprouted grain mixture, but we do find at certain times of the year, it's not quite enough. So yeah. if we can convert yeah, some of that some biomass and stuff like that, yeah, yeah. that's that same scenario of that's something that reproduces fast enough and in large enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they do. <laughs> well, we were thinking of yeah. duckweed um, and growing yeah. it in, in the totes. But then yeah. I, with our ponds here, I don't know if I'm just like tempting fate because like you can almost guarantee it's going to get to the pond, but it might happen anyways. And especially if I start putting plants in the pond. Um, you know, yeah, plants, and then it's pr it's probably gonna. And have having a bit of like, because our ponds are rather new, so um, I don't know if you like some you know people who know ponds can probably look at that and be like, oh, cool new pond. But um, for anyone else who doesn't know, I think the word a year, the one got finished last year, and the other one oh, the year before. I wanted I to think. jump right in there when we got there, and apparently it's, there's a lot of leeches. Like they <laughs> months. Really big. Oh, ones. yikes. So we're oh, talking yeah. freshwater eels. Oh, it, like, literally, like, on it, yeah. Like, I so think that, they the Stand By Me movie when they popped in the swamp. Again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, yeah. Maybe we can do a dragnet and, and get those leeches and, and feed them to the, the, the poultry. I don't know. I, oh, I, I have never been bit by a leech when There's I a lot that. in there. I I'm imagine that we, we could catch them. Yeah. Um, just because I'm thinking, uh, you know, the duckweed, I'm like, well, how great it would be if it was on there. And then you just, you know, you'd use the the little thing on the surface and scoop it all up and, and do that. But I don't know if I'm inviting more trouble into my life. Well, not. we've got an interesting thing with those ponds. Cause I'm, I mean, for so much of the year, they're, they're covered in ice and they're rather dangerous. And we've got all the dogs here all the time. We are going to have to fence them and not just fence them, them, but like a larger area around it. But the flip side of that is that, that means we're going to have a fenced area around the ponds that we could put the waterfowl in. Yeah. Um, man, we've gone off topic. Oops. <laughs> I, I realized we're in like fencing ponds and I'm like, oh, that's not tomatoes. This is yeah. the segue oh, to uh, the Dave also said there about the tilapia tank in the grow room. And that's what Chris's plan uh, is to got a tank started down there to uh because it, it's heated, so it's heating the grow room at the same time, right? So yeah, well, and if you're yeah, if you're heating the water for the for the tilapia or guppies or whatever, then you're getting that thermal mass in your grow room that helps keep the temperature mm -hmm. up. So Anyways, that's a whole nother, <laughs> whole nother thing. So um, I think we hit tomatoes. I don't know if there's anything else to add on there. Like it kind of, you can do it if you spread them out is basically. Yeah. And it's, and it's within the realm of you can, that's, that's one like beans. That's something where you can have the variety. Uh, yeah, yeah. for different uses in the same plant, which is kind of, uh, kind of nice. The only thing I would say on the, just to wrap up the tomato discussion, we kind of touched on this, but is before selecting your tomatoes, think about what you want them for, for that year. Uh, yeah. because if you're doing a canning garden, you're growing very different tomatoes than if you just want really nice tomatoes to eat fresh throughout the summer. Unless, um, unless... So if you're not going to grow a whole bunch of, you know, like we grow a paste tomato, we grow two different slicer tomatoes. Then we grow the Scotia tomato, which we use for juice and cherry tomatoes, basically. But the, the one, the one exception to that is if you wanted to do a trial. Yeah. Right. If you said, okay, I want a, a beefsteak tomato, but you didn't know which kind you could, if you have the space, you could space three kinds out, try them all and kind of see which one do I like from a flavor perspective. Cause that's something that doesn't, yeah. You, you'll know that year one, but you may not know how well the plant will produce. Will well, it's like la last year we tried um, for the first time, we tried the yellow pear tomato and we only grew one and we grew it in a pot, which allowed us to take it away from all the other tomatoes. No problem. So we were able to save seeds from it and decide if we really liked it. And we really did. So this year we're growing more of them. Yeah. Now I think for, for beef steaks, we've only grown, like kind of your generic ones. And then I think like brandy wine. Um, and I think that might be it. So I don't know. Do you guys have any favorite beef steaks? The brandy wine one is one we're trying this year. We're trying the pink brandy wine. Pink brandy wine. That's one we're trying for the first time this right, year. Because we don't have a pink tomato. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. I'm not a huge fan of the beef steaks myself. I tend to like. Huh. More slices of a, of a smaller, sweeter. Well, it's the flavor because I tend to, uh, I really didn't like tomatoes prior to growing them myself, but yeah. then when I grew them myself and the first round was a few oddity ones, that's why we have the black prints because that was one of the first ones. So that's going back to 2008. That was one of the first uh, varieties I've grown and I've saved seeds ever since. Um, 
but I liked the I liked the flavor, so I never really, uh, yeah, I've never really grown a beef steak. No, well, right. like you, you, yeah, you don't like the. I'm gonna say it. The ones that taste really tomatoey, he doesn't like. Right. Um, so there was a bit of experimenting to try and find a few that kind of were like a beef steak, a slicer, a nice slicer tomato. Um, yeah. The white, the white Thomas. The white Thomas is, is a that's a, a really nice yellow hair, heirloom one, and it's a really <laughs> nice one that we started growing last year for the first time, and we are upping the number we're growing this year because yeah. it was really good. Well, we found Crucy, uh, Crucy also uh, grows that it. one. He likes that one too. Yeah, leech traps. Yeah, that was that's the thought for um for fishing, um because I know we, you know worms. I always thought for fishing, um, you know, you you use a shovel, you dig basically anywhere, and you get some earthworms. So that was my experience growing up. And then I went and we're like, oh, we're going fishing, and she's like, well, where are you going to get bait? I'm like, well, I'm just going to get some worms, and we're about to leave. She's like, how are you? I gonna, laughed. How are you going to find worms? And I go and I put a shovel on the ground and I dig it up, and sure enough, there's nothing in there. And I just keep I keep looking at different spots and. I mean, it's because it was sand. We lived on sand. We yeah. lived on a property that was a, a nursery, um, uh, and it was like a, a the yard of the nursery. So they had taken the topsoil right off oh, the God. entire thing because they yeah. didn't want to be slipping and sliding on it, I guess. So they went down to the mm. subsoil, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in there with a shovel, and then we were we put T posts in into those things, and I nearly like you know killed myself doing that. The first home said was a rough go. Yeah, <laughs> the first of three. But yeah, leech traps. I don't know how efficient they are at like maybe I don't know any big leech traps. I know like little, you know, pie plate ones and you can catch leeches in that. Um, but if I'm trying to get like pounds of leeches, there, I don't know. There is bigger traps. I haven't looked into it in years, but um definitely could work. Yeah, what do we have? It's yeah, because I mean I don't I don't need them in there anyways. They're not doing anything for me. May as well feed feed some animals. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, we do have a lot. It's yeah, quite a lot. The heron likes them, obviously. Heron's in that all the time. Oh, yeah. No. So, um, peppers. May as well dive into yeah. peppers. How, how, what are the logistics of being able to keep some varieties of peppers going? Well, peppers are a little harder uh, because peppers have a very complete flower that is attractive to insects. So, it it does vary a little bit, but you're looking more around the 800 meter mark. Oh, and yeah, uh, uh -oh. because they are attractive. Now, that being said, you can't isolate in time for the most part because they all, they all are they're perennial, are, are they not? Yeah, Pretty not much. here, but so, so you can't use that, but you can isolate um, with cages. So, mm -hmm. there's different ways to do that, and so. Some plants that have that much outcrossing, like you can't do it with uh, with the squash because they have to have the insects, but the peppers are also self-fertile. So they're attractive, which is what causes the problem, but they're self-fertile. So if you isolate it, you will still get viable seeds. And you so, can get netting small enough? Uh, yeah, uh, a lot of the row covers and whatnot will do it. Okay. So okay. You can, I haven't you done that eat. before. Uh, you see it for like the broccoli and whatnot. They put it on just oh, for the cabbage cover. butterflies. Right. You, right. So you can use that. Here's you can also, I have no idea. Give me one second. You can find them. Find you can also take and bag flower clusters or individual flowers. So if you didn't want to cover the whole plant, so some varieties are small. We have one called uh, Aurora hot pepper, which is like, they get big. You can easily cover them. But then we have other varieties that, you know, they get two, two feet high and you grow a big patch of them. You can't necessarily, uh, isolate them uh, the same way as easily. So we're going to try this year because we want to, we're experimenting with peppers. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to try bagging the flowers and see how that goes. Yeah, Peppers are funny for us because we use a lot, an absolute ton, but we're really boring about it, I guess, because we only use jalapenos and we only use sweet peppers. And I don't, I don't care. I mean, like I buy the three pack of colors. Well, actually I buy the big, like no name, you know, like these ones are ugly. Um, because then I dehydrate them and I don't care. Um, but, uh, we, we use a lot of that. We use a lot more peppers now that we're dehydrating them because man, they go in everything. We yeah. throw that in anything. Like last night we made, um, we put them in tacos even in the meat. Yeah. yeah. Like, like, oh, yeah. Meat, kind of a staple for us now is taking a meat and a bunch of dehydrated, like mushrooms, peppers, whatever. Um, 
and cooking that in a gravy and then throwing that on rice or couscous or something. And it's just, it's so easy. It's all out of the pan. Like we don't spend any money to do it because it's like, well, the rice, I mean, we have in bulk typically the couscous. I do a lot with couscous. It's so fast. Like it's just, you know, bam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Carb. Um, oh yeah. We've got, what, what have we got? Uh, we did, uh, it was a hundred, we have 158 pepper plants. <laughs> <laughs> started downstairs so we know the feeling of you use a lot of peppers now a good yeah. pepper if you want it for sort of winter storage um is that we grow is uh Tolly's sweet italian frying pepper oh. so it's it looks they're like, like a, a, they look like a hot pepper they're long they're like a they're shepherd plate. pepper kind of but not as okay. huge. um but they can be they're really good green and they're really good red and they freeze they freeze amazing well we just nice. chop them up Lay it flat on a cookie sheet so that they aren't all stuck together when you put them in the bag. So freeze them yeah. on a cookie sheet, like flash freeze them, and then just bag them. We did probably did six six um, big, freezer big freezer bags full of them this year, and we've gone through it almost all because you can chuck it in pasta sauce. You can chuck it yeah. in tacos, like you say. It's and it's pretty much like you're fresh eating them. Yeah, they, they awesome. taste. Yeah, I mean, they, they rehydrate so well, I mean, or at least the ones I've been using. Like, I, I really I have a newfound appreciation for peppers we got to think of other ways of using peppers i know like i grew up and we'd have like grandma would make the, like a stuffed bell pepper mm. i don't think i've made that in my life i, but I can picture them with the, like, the little rice bits inside the meat yeah and, we've done that i, I don't love did, a cooked that was green the, pepper on, and everyone always about, makes with green peppers and i'm like oh the canadian <laughs> seed challenge this year we did uh, and I, I don't know if you guys saw it all but next year you can participate but anyways we did uh it's, you made a wish list and you posted the video and then people sent you seeds of what you were wishing for oh. and so we asked for people to send us seeds of the pepper that they think would be perfect for, that for stuffing peppers because i love stuffed peppers but we don't yeah. grow, we we hadn't found a pepper yet that we grew that was perfect for stuffing and yeah. so people sent us, so we've got uh, uh, three well, or four one, different ones. The one that sounds most promising bullnose. is bullnose. Bullnose. Uh, so it's nice. And it's well, a faster pepper, too. It's, yeah. Uh, it was only 45 days or something. It was short. It was, it was a short season, yeah. like, Which pepper. Which was surprising. Um, but yeah. anyway, so it was an interesting, uh, yeah. So yeah. when you mentioned about the stuffed peppers, that was something like I paprika or paprika. Yeah. Really yeah. say that was one of our, we, our wish list was for paprika peppers. Yeah, and the nice. um the any any type of pepper that people thought was perfect for stuffing because i love stuffed peppers yeah. and, but i have to actually buy peppers for that or you take the I, I, I want to love it because i can understand how like great of a meal that is but every it's always the green peppers that are like firm enough to do it and oh, yeah. i'm I, a cooked green pepper for me. I mean, raw. She hates I, it on I pizza. I have it on my pizza, but I mean, I don't. I, I don't I, like I, green peppers raw. at all. So, Chris won't eat green peppers. So I don't like green peppers, <laughs> but the the totally sweet Italian frying pepper, I don't mind them green. They don't. Yeah, okay. taste. They're supposed to be red though. Like you're right, yeah. they're red, but yeah, but they don't have by the same fall, flavor. We're always harvesting them green because we still have tons left in the garden. But they don't get yeah. that green pepper flavor. So do this before but, yeah. we yeah. forget to talk about it. So, so oh yeah. So just, all those are, we just oh, picked I, them up at the dollar store in the wedding section. They're like gift bags. Yeah, I have I and, have probably hundreds of those left over from when I was doing so. so and you can get yeah. them in multiple sizes. Mm -hmm. So this is the smaller size. And basically when that, when, when the, you know, it's about right before yeah. it blossoms, and you're right? Putting that branch. You, you put it on and then it, it's great because they're just a pull tie and then it's, contain nothing can get at it yeah. so that's i used to put all my little soaps in that so yeah, yeah. i've got a whole bunch of those that's perfect Sweet. Yeah. so um Yay. now you just if you get into the shepherd peppers or like our Tolly's italian we have to have a bigger bag because this would work for jalapenos or but things like that but that, that bag only has to be on until the pepper forms. until the pepper forms and then you and just then you have just to tag the pepper mark it with like right. some sagging tape or something and that's your seed pepper and then everything's fine it doesn't matter okay yeah. that's cool the jalapenos we do too. That's how you them. can grow tons of different kinds of peppers so, if you want. So to. the peppers are kind of the opposite of the squash because they still have the crazy separation distance of like 800 meters, but they're self-fertile. So you can isolate them and you don't have to do anything extra. You just have to isolate it. Whereas the squash, you had to all the isolate it, hand pollinate it and all this nice. other stuff. Right. So uh, it's. Oh, that's exciting. It's yes. more labor intensive than a lot of the other stuff, but when you start getting into all the varieties of peppers and 
the different ways you can use some of them. Yeah. That's where it, that's where this kind of does make sense, right? Because they're one of they're one of those things that they're not all the same between like yeah. whether they're hot, sweet, you know. Yeah. Well, well, we learned we have the pickled jalapenos because I make a dip that's like a big deal here, like in our house. It's, it's basically um like a jalapeno popper dip. Yeah. For, yeah. 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 Like we made so, it for our wedding. Like I made ahead like lasagna sheets of this of this thing because everyone was like, oh, but we're gonna see you and we want the dip. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I've never given the recipe out. It's one of those. It's uh, yeah. We tell people if you if yeah. you uh, like think jalapeno popper and you do cream cheese and and um, jalapeno, you get good chunk of the way there. But there's mm -hmm. like there's some secrets that have been uh, created yeah, around it, but... over the last decade. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we go through a lot of pickled jalapeno. I sense a recipe video coming. <laughs> that I've, I've, I've we'll, we'll, thought we'll, we'll of it. We'll censor it when we add a few things oh. and then we'll come yeah. back and be like, you figure it out. Yeah, I have a real hard, like, like we looked, um, we looked quite seriously actually at, um, going a commercial route with it because it's that, like, it's really good. It's really, but it's, really it's good. like also expensive, um, and cheese and that thing. But yeah, then, I mean, like I have done like the cost analysis on it. This thing's like 20 bucks a <laughs> thing. I mean, it's, it's expensive. Um, but uh, I mean, it's less than that, but it's, it, it's a lot. And it was, it was a hard, and in Ontario, it's so hard to sell food that you've made yeah. and like not go to jail. <clears throat> you sell it as dog food. Yeah, it's dog food. Yay. Yeah. I mean, the meat, you can get away with it a, a little bit easier, but I mean, you know, a prepared food. So we were going to be selling jalapeno plants and then be like, here's your free gift. Yeah. You buy, dip. you buy, uh, you know, a keychain yeah. and I'm going to throw in a food product for free. It's a free gift. So you're not buying food for me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a loophole. And then out here, I mean, like you drive, you just like driving into town and you pass two different like pie shops that are just people's houses. And they're like, yeah, we make pie. And I'm like, I love that that's allowed. I love that. I mean, the cottage oh, industry exists that's, and. That's a whole topic that would be. Yes. Yeah. yeah. A whole nother live because, it, but it is one of those things. It's like, and we're, we're, I'm going to say it. We're super cautious people because it only takes one screw up to just decimate. And, right? that's, and that's a big reason because we're in Ontario. I think, especially for a lot of U.S. viewers too, right? Because in a lot of U.S. states, you you can do that cottage type industry, like you say. But for us here, it's like you you can, but <laughs> to, to yeah. get to yeah. that is not exactly simple. So that's why we have this whole way of looking at things. Like we're just looking at the economics of how to feed ourselves as cheap as possible. Yeah. 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 And that's the thing, like we've been for so long, we've been so hyper focused on any possible um, avenue forward because we know what we want, but it's it's how do we fund it has always been the question. And we've known for a very long time that working a nine to five is not how we do that because then we're just miserable people. Um, and the answer is mark multi-level marketing. No, no, <laughs> stop. Um, no, but I mean, like, so, so we're like hyper focused. So we've looked out. The amount of different directions we've looked out at, even as just a short term thing to get around some kind of stupid loophole. I mean, I can't, it, it, it's wild. It's wild. Cause even here, I mean, we've got abattoirs everywhere. I mean, oh, like literally cool. everyone, have, you know, they've got these little, they've got the garages and they open them as these really cool butcher shops. And like with well, the place we took our deer to, he was just like, yeah, I mean, like I'll do the pigs. I'll yeah, do if whatever. You have a whatever. It's not when I have a moose. Yeah. And yeah. I'm like, fair. <laughs> Um, but you're allowed to do that. And in Ontario, it's not that you're not allowed to do it, the but they're like, the, the we process. need $60,000 and uh, um, accessible, what is the AFA? It's an or ASA. I can't, it was that new one that came out like four years ago, but you have to like put in a fully wheelchair accessible motorized, mm -hmm. you know, bathroom, like just in case the inspector needs it. And it's like, okay, cool. But this is like a small farm trying to do this thing. Like, you know what there's mean? No, it, uh, there's no yeah, sheet of plywood out in the sun. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's all. It's fine. Um, there's but yeah, no, the legality. Uh, recreation made on this scale. That's, yeah. I think that's a huge. Yeah. That's a huge thing on a lot of topics. That yeah. there really yeah. needs to be a graduation. Yeah. Of, that's how the little guy gets squashed because you have to follow the rules of the big guy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, well, it's, and a, and a de escalation of um, supports rather than. Okay, you're a little bit better off, and now you're screwed because yeah. you don't have the help anymore. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, that's something that we get frustrated with. I mean, like we have this, I mean, talk, conversation argument sometimes depending who we're talking with um, about how people are just like, you know, it's not that bad and it's this and it's that and it's this. And I'm like, all you want to do is sit in your subdivision and then drive to work and then go home. I'm like, of course, what you're, you want to do is legal. <laughs> I'm like all these other things, all the things we're interested in. Yeah, they don't, they don't, they don't see do. the and, roadblocks that are created because, yeah. you know, it, it's not in front of them, right? So, uh -huh. but, yeah. But then, I mean, just putting blinders on for a moment and looking at food, right? A lot of people don't even, don't even understand where the food comes from, which yeah. is probably one of the biggest issues, right? Or don't want to understand. Yes. That's yes. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Not so much, not so much we'll the 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 door. I don't think people have a problem understanding where the vegetables come from. It's more the meat and the animal products where they would just prefer not to, not yep. to know. Yep. Or they're super processed food. Well, yeah. That's, <laughs> Nobody <laughs> wants to know where that comes from either. That's a whole yeah. Yeah, no, And you really don't, you know, it's. Um, now there was a, a mention yeah. of Carolina Reapers and other like crazy, oh, yeah, you not just hot peppers. Oh, super like, hot peppers. At one, at one point, the Carolina Reaper was the hottest in the world. It's not now. I don't even think it's close now. Um, there's a lot it's more still hot too food. hot for me. No. <laughs> oh, seriously, like I, yeah, my question I, is, what do you even do with it? Do you just make a powder? Is it just like, I want to take like, an, a, a, you know, yeah, well, we, maybe, maybe ra Ravel, Ravel to expand can uh, say what he's going to do with it. Yeah. 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 He's going to say he just like eats some raw. I don't know. Uh, that's got to <laughs> oh. be one heck of a taste bud. Oh yeah. Yeah. We I couldn't, with, I couldn't uh, do it. We find with yeah. The people, peppers. I mean, the, uh, like, because we do grow that, that Aurora pepper, it's like uh, medium heat, what, you know, if you were to categorize it. And we do basically, we, they're small enough, we just, they we don't have to dehydrate them. They'll just dehydrate themselves on the counter <laughs> yeah. over, over time. And then you basically just, you grind them up into a powder and it's kind of like a chili type powder yeah uh we only really go that far with it well and i did i did fermented hot sauce with mm -hmm. uh jalapenos and and that sort banana of stuff and banana peppers that sort of thing but we're not super hot no taste bud people so <laughs> my like, hot sauce would be like most people laugh and be like that's not even well, we like, mildly hot <laughs> we, we like spice yeah. we only like <clears throat> so much spice i'll go i'll go medium so medium hot like, like white chicken, guy medium hot spicy, crazy yeah. Yeah. I have to I have to consciously make an effort to to put spice into things so that I can actually handle it if I'm at a restaurant and they're like, you know, with a bit of red pepper, but they mean like cayennes or some shit. Um because that happens to me all the time. I'll get this like innocuous like pasta dish and I'm like, this is safe. And then it is not safe. And I've got spicy hiccups like a weirdo in the corner and I'm getting cut off and I'm not even drinking. Like it's not great. It's not great. So <laughs> yeah, if you're making hot sauce, you'll have to tell us, uh, you have to make a video on how that goes. Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah, if it, if it turns out, maybe we'll, we'll barter for something and I'll have to try that out. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how small of an amount I'd have to have if it's, um, reaper hot sauce, but <laughs> that would be yeah, the hot sauce I get, it, it's fairly mild. Um, yeah, we get the Valentina. It's hotter than Tabasco, but it's not like it's not, not crazy. Right. Well, I find there's flavor to that one, which is nice. Well, yeah, and I, I usually mean, most hot sauces for me, I'm just like that's hot and not enjoyable, and there's no benefits. I'm happy to add the like, the kind of the vinegary flavor to it and whatever else it has going on. If it's such a hot hot sauce, and I don't want to like you know burn my face off, you know, it's like it's, it's like a drop, and you've changed the heat of the dish. Um, I can't imagine it's changing flavor, and and maybe that's the point. Maybe you can add such a small amount. It just makes it hot and doesn't really change the, yeah. what it tastes well, that's like. That's a great yeah. idea, actually, what James is saying there. Like, you know, making a sweet salsa and then just putting a bit of it in to give it a little yeah. kick. Um, yeah. I bet you that would be quite tasty. But to make just a pure hot sauce with it, oh, my gosh. Well, and that's yeah. another thing to, to come back around to the seed saving, too. And I think this is more applicable to the hot peppers. But you still have the ability to separate by time. Right. So yeah. in the case of the hot peppers, like the jalapenos are different because we do this with our, um, our black Hungarian peppers, which are similar to a jalapeno in spiciness and whatnot. You kind of want them every year. But for some of those yeah. peppers that you're only going to make some hot sauces or whatever, you could have extra variety and not have to run around and put bags on like 10 different kinds of peppers <laughs> in one year by, you know, only growing them every second or even every third year because you how many do you actually need when they're that hot? Yeah. yeah. So, no. think 
bell peppers, the different colors. This is just something we, we've talked about on different occasions. And they say, okay, this one's a yellow one. This one's a green one. They all become all the colors, right? It's just like maybe they're maximizing the flavor at a certain point. No, in development not, or... not necessarily. So you can. They don't go orange are, or red. If you there got are green varieties one. that are, will never change color. They are. They will always stay green. There are varieties that are all of the different colors, like individual ones, and then there are some varieties that will change throughout time. So it's okay. based really on the mood. Uh, the, most of your most of the air when you get into the heirloom varieties of peppers i find most of them are true to one color yeah. they'll okay. start out green and you can eat them at different stages like they'll they'll turn kind of a yellowy orange before they turn red or something like that but they won't usually turn but they like don't usually you won't get a purple one and a yellow one and a red one uh yeah. unless there is some i would say it's probably some sort of uh, hybrid or or it could be something that's been developed but a lot of those older heirloom ones um, you know, most of them are, it's like shepherd peppers are red, you know, they're all red. Well, and there then, are yellow yeah. ones, but they, they don't, you don't get yellow and red. Ones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the so jalapenos I've seen go red. Is that just an anomaly or is that, or do they all go red? That, no, they, they will go red. That when means they get they're hot. fully ripe. So okay. they'll be the ones you want for seed saving. So they'll go okay. even water basically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -oh. um, well, we don't different have different variations. On that. Yep. What about purple jalapenos? Oh, never had purple jalapenos. I know, oh, I know bought, they exist. Yeah, we bought them that time. Were they jalapenos would, or was it just like, look at this purple pepper? No, I think they, I, they were labeled as purple jalapenos. But yeah. I would assume because purple is a color that does come like some peppers. Some peppers will go purple before they change to their final color. Like our, right. our Aurora peppers, they'll start out purple, then they'll change red. Um, and then you do have some peppers that the final color is purple. So it... It probably depends. The problem with jalapenos is, not, I shouldn't say problem, but there are a lot of varieties of them, right? And yeah. like when you, this is something that kind of irks me about uh, sort of grocery store produce is very seldom does it ever come with the name of the variety that was used to produce it. It's usually pepper. just like, yeah, sweet bell <laughs> pepper, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, but that's not what is it? really... Yeah, that's not telling anybody anything about it, right? Because when you start going down that rabbit hole, and peppers are a crazy one because there are so many varieties. Like considering yeah. their separation distance is pretty big, it's it's amazing that there's so many varieties of them. Yeah, <laughs> that have different heats and different colors and different sizes and different <clears throat> leaf patterns, and like they've they've pretty much been diversified into a lot. Yeah. Well, that happened to me the other day or about a month ago, I went to Home Depot and accidentally came home with like a crate of plants and they, this That's house plants, and yeah, it just happened. I mean, I, I walk inside the house and Jack's like, do you need a handler? Like, is that a thing? And yeah, so I, um, I had all these, these plants and I was like, the varieties will be on them. I will know what they are. I can figure out if they're going to kill the cats or if I have to put them somewhere else. And literally the information that I had was a UPC and a 4.5 inch tropic plant. Tropical. Yeah. I was yeah. like, what the hell is this? I'm like, that is, is that a zero information? Because House plants are kind of weird sometimes. Even on their website, the and... they're like, there's a variety of them. And I'm like, yeah, but now that I've bought it, what is it? What is it? Like, <laughs> I need some kind of something here, you know, and it turns out that half of them were in fact toxic to cats. Um, so I'm sure I have, I have a, in order, but I have a digression theory here that um, broaching slightly into the doom side of things. That yeah, yeah. Doom. Well, it time. it's time for doom. It's okay. It's doom. Uh, the, <laughs> making things generic like that. Now that's an ex to me that's an extreme example where you could take a bunch of house plants that are not related whatever and just kind of say yeah they're house plants yeah. that, they, could be, they could be giving you anything they could be giving you redwood trees or it's like yeah it's a hit it's a plant that you have in the house but you see that that generic marketing time and time and time again and it's really like we just said about vegetables it's really mm -hmm. rampant in the food industry mm -hmm. where nobody has any clue it's a pepper well pe all peppers we just like we've just said all peppers are not the same in fact, yeah, there's yeah. A, an enormous amount of variety there. Same with tomatoes. They're not all the same. Like, it, it makes no sense to me. It's a yellow tomato. Well, 
there's like probably 200 yeah. varieties of yellow tomato. <laughs> what is it? And they don't yes. all taste the same and they don't all. Um, yeah. That's and there are reasons for <laughs> why they are. I mean, like we have that sometimes when people are like, if they're asking how to grow something and they've never done it before and they're like, well, it's a this. And I'm like, I'm going to need more because I mean, it's possible that you're never going to be able to grow whatever that is. I mean, like we yeah. do, you know, I mean, like, yeah, sorry. Well, that's where I think a lot of this stuff gets important because it sort of awakens when you start seed savings, kind of the gateway in my mind to this, <laughs> because it's accessible to most people, even if they don't have a lot of property, because there's something in this list of vegetables that they probably can save seeds from. But then it, it forces you to realize that there is all this diversity and this diversity is there for a reason. And yeah, there are some varieties of squash that you look at them and go, why are they two different named varieties in there? They, they do seem to be the same. And maybe that's all it is, is Bob grew this one and Harry grew that one and they just yeah. named it. Yeah. But, but then there's in the same species, you can still see all the, the variety. Like, yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a big awakening moment because it starts to open your eyes to other things that are going on too. Yeah, it's uh, going too far down yeah. the doom. Well, that that's going like the same thing. Like basically, eventually, heritage pork won't be exist, or th you know, and people will just assume pork is pork, and it's like no heritage, like homegrown pork uh, doesn't taste anything like the store water. Yeah, you know, go into that discussion. It'll right just now. be wild pigs. Wow, <laughs> which <laughs> are delicious, but they are now considered. Envy species in Ontario the legally listed that uh, they're wiping any, them out yeah any pig that uh, which makes I, I get it for the wild pig but they actually have it listed that just it's pigs yeah well yeah. they have it listed oh, as no. that in through much of the states too and it didn't really didn't really slow things down yeah and the fear mongering over the feral pigs my god so the, the Facebook community group that we used to be part of um where we used to live was at least like once every two months someone would be like feral pigs are loose in this area and oh my god i saw it, it was like, like always a pot-bellied pig it was someone's <laughs> pot-bellied pig they would just get out and then be like oh look there's a farm over there they must have food i mean like it was it, but people but would now there's food. now there's uh re there's regulations in ontario that there's certain actions have to be taken if your pig any pig gets out <laughs> which it's it's a catch-22 because i get it right because what we've seen in in parts of the U.S. It, it happens, and if they get out and they breed, but then you have the yeah, same yeah. you have the same thing where it's like you say somebody's pot belly pig that walks down the sidewalk to visit the neighbor. That yeah, yeah. that's is, not a feral hog, but isn't really a yeah is uh, not and like they do pig. cause challenges. Yeah. But I think it's been said. I think it was on Meat Eater where they said um, the vast majority of people who complain about the the pigs, but they they love hunting them, they love eating them, they love that it's available and there's no limits. And even the farmers who have like a, a financial problem with them, they get revenue from these pigs, you know, to make up for that even. Um, and an excess of a had, resource is still a resource. If they had a magic wand and they could make all those pigs disappear, would they actually do it or, yeah. or not? Yeah. You know, and a lot yeah. of them wouldn't wouldn't do it. They they're happy there, even though they'll complain about it. They're happy they're there. So it, yeah. it's hard. But like, usually, if you talk to your average person, they're just gonna be mad about it. That yeah. would be a go to conversation, I'm sure. But yeah. So um, for peppers, um, you can grow. Lots of different varieties. You can uh, float those along if you're careful about it. We just gotta um, bag our seed pepper. So here's the question: How many are you um, juggling right now? Uh, what do we have? Uh, well, we we've always grown three varieties. We grow uh, the four. well, okay, four. if you count the little one, we grow totally <laughs> sweet. We've always grown totally sweet Italian. Uh, we grow the black Hungarian for our hot pepper. It's basically mm. like a jalapeno. Um, but not, well, it's probably about the same heat. And then we grew the dough hill pepper, which was a really nice little one, which is fun for stuffing, but it's really little. Um, and then we had these little decorative, the Aurora, Aurora ones, ones that we did for hot peppers, but we didn't grow them all the time because we didn't use them to any massive amount, but we always grew the other three. <clears throat> and so this year we've decided to do a little bit of a trying new one. So we're trying three different paprika peppers, uh, three different mm -hmm. kinds. So we've got 14 of each of those kinds growing. And then we have the, um, uh, what are they, the blue, 
bull nose. The bull nose peppers are being added to the uh, mix as well. So this year we're kind of doubling. We're doing eight varieties instead of the four we normally do. Now, and Chris said you want to uh, do it over multiple years to make sure. So are you going to, are you going to stick with that or you're just, uh, you well, we're going to probably years, choose, we're, we're, we're growing them all to save seeds this year, all the peppers, but the paprika, we're growing enough to make a batch of paprika out of each kind and see which to one see which one we like, because we only okay. want to grow one. Um, Ideal, ideally. ideally, it would be one that we grow. So we're, we're, that's why we did so many. You're going to become paprika time. connoisseurs and you're going to want all of them. You're not going to be able to imagine your life without the differences of like on your deviled eggs. Yeah, I, and, oh, subtle, that's that's subtle. Subtle. It's like a wine, a wine taster. I'd be a paprika yeah, taster. Yeah. It's yeah. Awesome. But you to be all, honest, all I'm the... planning to smoke them all because it's smoked paprika that I love. Yeah. Yes. So they're all going to taste like smoke okay. anyway. Well, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> so good. I, I forgot about paprika and we like, I do like using it. And, yeah. and the deviled eggs. We're, we're thinking of doing a video here soon where we're like, okay, everyone posts their like favorite egg recipes because I think we're all probably drowning in eggs. We're all probably sick of our own egg recipes. That'd be a good one, actually. Yeah. Yeah. around a bit. That'd we got a couple really of these. Good. Your deviled yeah. eggs are really yeah, good. Yeah, how to, yeah, when you have eggs. a glut of eggs, which everyone does or will soon have yeah. um, right now, you know, what, what are your go-to... Uh, What's your what's your standard to use a lot, and what's like a fancy one that uh, that people do? Yeah, we try kind of creative. What's that? With, Sorry, with the, the, eggs. the eggs, omelets really. That's the standard. Yeah. The standard is omelets. The, the kids don't like just fried eggs, so it has to be omeleted up with we peppers. Do, and we we like fried eggs. We eat eggs every pretty much every day for breakfast. Yep, um, this, time, this time of year when we have plentiful eggs. Uh, but, uh, we also, we also will say we do a thing with the eggs because they have such a long shelf life. Oh, bacon we, quiche. Yeah. Quiche, is quiche uses a lot of eggs. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, that right that, up. that's you my go-to. Go and it's also my fancy one because I throw whipping cream in it and then I'm like, there you go. Um, goose eggs make amazing quiche. If you have geese eventually, uh, yeah. they make the amazing ducks. quiche. And or the ducks. ducks. We use the duck eggs also for quiche all the time. Yeah. Uh, Marilyn, are you in the live? Last night when I was talking about my my college meals, uh, Mr. Noodle. Yeah, <laughs> seriously, it's like, like I don't know. We've broken it out occasion, like I don't know, maybe like twice since we've been together. It's been like dire enough that I'm like, okay, we have three dollars for dinner, and we're doing this, and it's much less good than I remember. Well, we'll have to do the. It's not. It's not great. The Mr. Noodles <laughs> and uh, a poached duck egg on top, and you know. Yeah. I don't know if that, that makes it yeah. fancy or not. but French uh, toast. See, I always forget about French toast. Jack makes really good bread, but we eat it immediately. Mm -hmm. And I mean, like, immediately. Like, if there were dinner plans, there are no longer dinner plans. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem uh, with homemade bread. Oh, yeah. it is so good. So good. 5,000 acres. What? That's a lot of acres. I see that. Uh, yeah, that. Well, um, Dave. Dave said above uh, ninety percent. Um, at least probably in Ontario. Anyways, anything that's locally grown oh. is grown in Leamington, where Dave is. Uh, we yeah, used to yeah. go. Dave will. Dave will be able to relate to this. But as birders, mm -hmm. it is a birding hotspot, and we used yep. to go to Peely yeah. all the time. So we probably drove right by his house. And we're yeah, you went to you home. went to go see the pheasants, right? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, yeah, so he's talking about all the stuff that's grown in, in the, the land down there. I mean, oh my gosh. Yeah, we know a little bit about that because we worked with migrant workers for so long and a lot of um, a lot of them spent time in Leamington yeah. mm -hmm. because um, we were like, we didn't need the number that we had always, um, which most farms don't, right? So there's a whole like, you know, we uh, did, um, sharing situation going on speaking there. of the burning hot spot down there um I, i've never been i went to the the huron fringe bird festival um the last one i think before oh, yeah. it before all yeah. the covid stuff um and that was fun and they had like you know different events and stuff and but one of them was the uh, a big day um event so you're up you know before the sun and out out there you know after I the sun and that. doing the owls and stuff yeah. um and that was that was nuts. The guy was just driving, and again, people have different rules about what they count for. You know, did you have to see it, or if you, did you just hear it? For me, especially if it's a life bird, I I, I need to see that thing. Um, and uh, he's driving, and he he just like drives slowly and has the window down, and he's like telling us to write down bird names. And I'm like, I, okay, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
I do that. Yeah, I've, got a bit of a, I've got a bit of a rule where, I shouldn't say rule, but for me, it depends on the bird. So yeah. Um, yeah. like night jars, for example, like uh, we've gone to hear the uh, um, uh, Chuck Will's widow that uh, and a couple of them seen or heard, but it's like, that's one of those ones where you can hear it very clearly, you know what it is, but you are never likely going to see it. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. That are, are very slim. So for things like that, that's the same with me and Bob White quails. I have heard them on Walpole Island, which is the last remaining pocket of the wild ones. Yeah. No chance of seeing them, but it was still pretty cool to hear them. Well, yeah, if you they're really, pretty If you need that on your life list, we should talk privately later because I might know a spot where you'll definitely hear and see wild ones that is not on any birder thing and they're legitimately wild hmm. that's cool yeah we have to uh, chat about that later yeah, no, 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 <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm not i'm not like giving that out to the world but there's uh there's a few things there sorry i, I just like went off screen because so we were working in the barn like crazy today and apparently i have a new allergy to something <laughs> And oh. the last couple of days I have had seasonal allergies and I like don't understand what's going on. And I've been pretty good. But then at the same point in both these lives, all of a sudden my sinuses are just like now. OK. And, it's, you know, and I don't want to like just like haul off in the middle of the live. I'm mildly I'm, allergic to dust. I'll get hives. <laughs> we talked about yeah. uh, the Swiss chard yesterday when we were talking about the beets. And I see Marilyn uh, from Little Homes on the Beach. She posted that she does Swiss chard for the crust on her quiche. Ooh, very intrigued by that. That would be as cool. the crust. Well, I think that deserves a video. Yeah, yeah, yeah that would be a good. We'll be video. watching for that uh, video, Marilyn, because uh, I see that. yeah, I'm I do. Um, that. I I don't always do a crust because usually I'm just making quiche because we have too many eggs. But if I'm actually prepared, I have a recipe uh, for a crust that I use. Like literally, it doesn't matter if it's savory, sweet, nothing, and it turns out every single time. Um, thank you, oh, Boss Stewart. Um, and I usually make like a whole bunch of them at once. So I was thinking I'd do a video on that sometime soon and maybe make a quiche and a chicken pot pie and like an apple pie or something. I don't know. Yeah. That's we'll probably do a thing on, on carbonara at some point. Cause we use like six duck yolks mm -hmm. in that. Yeah. Um, I go a little bit okay. overboard, but yeah. yeah, it's really good. It's yeah. He makes a really good carbonara. I mean, now it's like, now we need to eat. <laughs> and, then we, yeah. and then we feed all the whites usually to the dogs. Yeah. Um, when we're if I remember. That. Sometimes I just put them in the fridge, and then like a week later, I'm like, "What is this weird thing?" In the yeah, it's crushed into the bottom. Dried into hole. this like film, yeah. and you're yeah. like, oh. "I think it it turns into some sort of mineral. It might be worth something. I don't know. I haven't looked into it." That's one thing. If I had like <laughs> unlimited money and I could design my own appliance or buy like a super fancy appliance, I would want a a very long, narrow fridge with lots yeah. of different spots, but like not enough depth to totally <laughs> screw it up. <laughs> Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I want to do my first in first Just a sale. hallway of fridge. But, like, I, again, like, <laughs> and I, I retailed for too long. So I need everything spread out across, like, done right. Like, I can't do the things are behind other things. Like, I just, I don't know. Well, I, 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 I'm, it. I'm pretty tall, so I'm looking, like, down at everything. So I can't see, you know, even one thing deep into the fridge. Um, <laughs> and, unless I, like, get right on my knees and then, you know, get in there and, and see what's in there. But... <laughs> which you know once every couple months i do and i find lots of things in there it's that i did not know all the time wears <laughs> I was say, that's the one thing about uh homesteading and canning stuff and all that sort of stuff when you open a can and you use part of it and then it goes in the fridge and then they all look the same right <laughs> and the kids go and just grab a new one and open another one like there's got to be six ketchups open in the fridge yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing you make a, a lifetime supply of ketchup and you know it's just like it's like water why 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 would i it's like when i we had uh, the apple trees that uh were growing up and we didn't really harvest the apples but i would take a bite of one and just throw it and take a bite of another one because it's all going to fall off the tree and rot anyways yeah. and we're not we're not we weren't collecting them um so i feel like people are just taking that attitude and with your ketchup now yeah just, <laughs> you know just a little one fry and then just throw the jar <laughs> that sounds like a, a fresh one <laughs> got to get that new new yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we hit tomatoes and peppers. Um, I know there was other things on the list. I'm not organized. Well, and you kind of touched on the cucumbers a little. Well, yeah, yeah, we hit that right at the beginning. Um, actually, I'll show that again for for anyone who wasn't in right at the beginning. We have a um, 
a bit of a wild cucumber problem. I want to say it's a problem. So it's going to, the video is going to swing around here. And then in between the wood pile at the bottom right and the house, there's this big swath of a vine. And that is all wild cucumber. That all is just it. a crazy amount of wild cucumber. Oh, it's yeah, it's insane. It's, uh, it's beautiful. Well, it's choking out all, but... all those trees and. It's not what we want in that spot because we want to be like a terrace garden situation in that spot. And we're like, well, it's just you know. lousy with wild cucumber seeds at this point. Yeah. But yeah, so we got to figure something out there. We don't really, I mean, like, I want to get into uh, pickling um, cucumbers and we like the fresh eating ones a lot, but I like the fresh eating ones always. I've tried dehydrating them, that was terrible. Um, so I think that might be one of the ones that I want to attempt inside, which is probably just far beyond my ability. So cucumber, I'm going to say I'm going to do cucumbers and melons kind of together because again, they have like an 800 meter separation distance because they have perfect flowers that need to be insect pollinated. So inside can be problematic. Um, is it getting, is it uh, uh, gardening on the prairies? Yes, she grew some inside. Yeah, uh, little, little little homes. No, little garden. On the little prairie. garden on the prairie. Prairies. That's what it is. Yeah, uh, okay. she she has a, a video on it where she did grow some inside. I believe she had to hand pollinate them. Ooh. And, but the problem with cucumbers and melons is squash are bad for boarding. Cucumbers and melons are really bad for it. So if you, the easiest, basically the easiest way to do it is you pick one. Um, because unless you can, unless you can meet the, uh, the separation distance, they're, uh, not easy. Like they'll abort mm -hmm. even when they've been pollinated properly, if they aren't happy with the water level or environment or whatever. So James yeah. mentioned yeah. there again about the, uh, the cu wild yeah, cucumbers the, to be the sponge or loofah. Yeah. yeah. We'll have to do that. I'll collect a whole bunch and then we'll, I guess. See, I don't just want to tear it out. I'd rather transplant a bit, but I don't want to move a problem either. So it's... I mean, they're all hanging see. there on the vine, those little loofah, yeah, you know, husks. Really cool. oh, it must um, be cat time. We're getting jumped on by cats too. Yeah, yeah it's feeding <laughs> time. It's like, hello. <laughs> well, he went and bit me last night, which was not nice. The one thing we use sponges for um, is uh, cleaning eggs when we bother to do it. Um, so maybe that's... Maybe we could use. I mean, I don't clean eggs anymore. If people want to buy eggs, I, yeah, I do not. Yeah, they're, get, they're getting the poop. Um, <laughs> I I just can't with my back. I just cannot stand there and clean. Well, and you're food. better off not to wash them anyways. So yeah, well, yeah. I just I always felt weird about sending poopy eggs. And be like, here, here you go. Well, that was um, a big thing with us with the duck eggs because you're really better off. Oh, like, that's why that's you why have duck to eggs. Scrub the crap out of them. Well, and but if you take the bloom off, then their shelf life yes. is like nothing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But mind you, we yeah. did that without knowing, and we cleaned them, and we put them in on the counter, not even in the fridge, and we still ate them at least two weeks later, and it was well, that's not too bad. That's yeah. not yeah. too bad. Yeah, like, but yeah, like we don't we don't clean them for ourselves. We leave everything out on the counter. Like we are we are sold one hundred percent on that. But. Um, yeah, when people are like, oh, yay, eggs. But the good thing about here is that everyone has chickens, so everyone's selling their eggs. So people aren't as desperate for it because it's not just like you're the only place who has them. There's tons yeah. and tons and tons of people. Like, Especially when you have like white or just like peach colored eggs and that's it. You don't have like yeah, every, like every chicken special. breed under the sun to you get know. the rainbow, you know, cartons. Yeah. And colors. Yeah. yeah. And as much as we're drowning in eggs, I mean, like we always find uses for them. And again, we have six dogs. So every once in a while, yeah. everyone gets two eggs on their food and that clears a lot of eggs. Like a <laughs> lot. Yeah. Um, sometimes they need a little bit, you know, to get you like the one has a sensitive stomach. So she'll get a little bit farty um, if we switch to two eggs too quick. But like everyone else, you know, they just love it. So it's a good, uh, it's good. Well, too, too many eggs is not necessarily a horrible problem to have. No, yeah. it's yeah, it's it's First it's problem. nice. We like we gotta try that lime water thing with the eggs. The yeah, yeah, we gotta try that. Break. Yeah, see, we we never uh, see we're fine. We're kind of funny because with the partridge on eclairs, like right now, nobody's well. They're starting to collect, but there's this period in the spring when they start to ramp up. We get eggs like there's no tomorrow. Yeah, and then they go broody, and it's like cut in half. 
Yeah. And they kind of they, they dribble back into it over the fall. So we end up we just kind of stockpile them. So we do keep them out. Yeah. But then yeah. as as time goes on, we do put them in the fridge. Yeah, and they'll, they'll, they'll keep for I always say in in a crisis situation, if you needed to have a chicken sit a bunch of eggs, it's nice that you put them on the counter instead of in the fridge. Yeah. So yeah. we always have probably what six dozen sitting on the counter. And then you just kind of, and then we have another 12 dozen in the fridge and we just (laughs) rotate them. Everything's dated. So we take out of the fridge, you put one off the counter into the fridge and just kind of rotate it through. And it seems to work really well. I mean, like we've got um, a nice stockpile that when the chickens, we allow them to naturally stop laying and do their molt and do everything natural. So we just stockpile enough eggs that if we go two months without an egg, it doesn't matter. We've got plenty of eggs. What's yeah. the oldest counter egg you've eaten? Uh, probably close to three months. Yeah. See, same. Because, like, I, so we spend some time. Um, like you say, they're just in, and we always store the eggs pointy side down. Yeah. We, ro- yeah, we like flip if we're like, we'll like move the carton right over. Um, yeah. Because, yeah, we spent, like, I spent some time. Um, when I was growing up on a, on a sailboat and we didn't have a very large freezer. So that's when we started learning about like the egg situation and how they can keep for that long. If you're flipping and you know, they haven't been washed. Um, so that was, I mean, that's cool. And some people get super weird about that. You know, they're like, what do you mean you haven't washed them? Why are they in the fridge panic? And I'm like, it's not milk. Like it's, no, yeah, it's okay. No, exactly. it's okay. No, washing right before we use you know, them. We, we, I don't used, even bother. we used to do yeah. that. We don't bother now. If it's going to get yeah. cooked, I'm like, eh, yeah, I, if it's like I'm crusted, inhaling the stuff anyway. If it's then a really a dog egg. If it's a really gross egg right. and I'm making yeah. carbonara something that doesn't get cooked to the same degree that maybe other things do, yeah. um, I won't pick that egg. I'll pick a slightly cleaner one. Yeah, we'll grab different ones, but um, um, we tend to anything that's really dirty, we eat it sooner and we just save the ones that are in better shape because we know they'll keep longer. Yeah. And if it's really bad, I actually just crack it for the chickens right in the coop. Yeah, I'm not um, dealing. I'm not putting this in my pocket. Yeah, no. <laughs> and we're. I, I mean, I know. I know that a lot of people are going to be like, ah, panic that you know they're going to start eating their own eggs. Um, ours, knock on wood, have not done that. And we had some soft shell issues, and we just started doing that because we couldn't get the oyster. Or they we haven't didn't gotten have it or something, and, and they we started doing that, and it, it just worked. I know. Yeah. I know we could have like baked them and crushed them and done all that, but. I mean, now they like follow me around and they're like, eat the eggs, they, but they won't eat the egg that's right beside them. So they haven't seemed to have gotten in the habit of, of pecking uh, yeah. a, an egg. If it's already cracked, they will. Um, like if it was cracked in the frost or something, they, they would go for it when it thaws. Um, because they're, they're, they kind of wait for us to, if we're going to throw an egg and crack it on the ground and yeah. it's already like exploded. And I don't know, it hasn't translated over to them pecking their eggs. They're still all sitting there that's waiting true. for us. And they're waiting for us to crack one on the floor for them. So. Yeah, which is well, the one day actually, and I got footage of it. I should, I wish I had it. Um, but I went to throw the egg, and a chicken ran underneath, and it just like bounced off its back. Um, threw, it, threw an egg at a chicken. I was like, boom! Oops! <laughs> like, oh no, James, that makes a lot more sense. Sorry, I was like, I didn't even stop to think about. So I've never egg. done that before. That's interesting. But, Putting yeah. the eggs in the. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. Huh. That makes sense. We end up we uh, we just process ours up for the worm bins, yeah, yeah. and then yeah, it ends so up on the garden. Yeah, yeah. Well, we had an old um, uh, freezer that I was going to make into a worm bin. I just put a different lid on it, um, and uh, but it's mostly insulated. And I thought that was great, and it sat in our barn for five, for five years. years, and then we moved. Um, it's so, still there. So the, yeah, I'm sure the broken freezer is still sitting in there. No, barn. no, we got the appliance guy came out and he oh, took okay. all. I say the appliance guy was a scrap metal guy who would take uh, appliances. But I was going to um, build a nice skirt around it. I wasn't going to look like a freezer sitting yeah. against the house, but it was going to. It's going to look pretty cool. Oh, here's a good. We we'll still have to do it at some point. Yeah, we've got uh, little worm bins uh, with five gallon buckets and like a tower, just in the house, yeah. yes. and they they work pretty good. Um, we're at the stage now where it's like. Do we build another one or mm. not? Because we're getting to the point that uh, the population's getting pretty big in there. Yeah. Do you harvest the liquid out of it? Yes. Yeah. And, and what's, what do you use that for? Uh, for for watering plants, we usually dilute it uh, quite a yeah. bit, but uh, mostly indoor plants. Depends how much of it we have at a time. 
I actually have to do that this weekend. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, I like that like they're small and you, you do read online that sometimes the, the five gallon bucket tower, some people are like, well, it, it gets too hot or too cold or this, that, whatever. We have them, they're sitting in the hallway of our house. They don't smell. They never smell. They don't, uh, they don't escape them. Nothing. There's holes drilled in the sides for ventilation and holes in the bottom. Uh, the bottom bucket's got a smaller, I forget the size, but there's smaller holes so the worms can't go through and the liquid yeah. drains yeah. out. And then you just put a new tower on top of it and uh, it, it works surprisingly well. Well, you've had those. They've yeah. been three years now. Yeah. We should like do that. that. Now, I assume you have a video on this or several. We do have a couple. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. Now you'll be going back to some of the first videos we ever did. So just oh, keep that in mind. Yeah. <laughs> That's no one that way. should potentially be redone now that we have a bit more education. Well, we'll do some more. <laughs> yeah. I already want to redo videos that we did in like January. I'm like, that wasn't that good. <laughs> Dave oh, Knight's God. talking about the, the pickled eggs in the bar. And, uh, yes. then and the pickled onions. onions. Adding green food coloring, and all I can think of is green eggs and ham off of uh, Dr. Zeus. <laughs> <laughs> so, what okay. about this question Marilene has about the oyster? Could she use clamshells? Would it do the same thing? Uh, it should. Yeah, because it's still uh, the oysters might be. I can't. I think they only use the oysters because they end up with so much extra. Mm. Like they're basically secreting the shell. It's probably slightly different nutrients, but I'm sure it would work the same yeah. because it's still, it's still uh, um, just, I don't, yeah. You can't get commercial quantities of clam shells the same way you can oyster, oyster shell. shells. shells yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but if you have access to it, why not? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're going to have to do that, Mitch, to the whole like ocean trip and get the salt and get the seaweed and get the clams and just do a whole thing, you know? Yep. You know, maybe like once a summer go down and make a real thing out of it. This cat's getting violent. I can tell <laughs> an explosion here in a minute and it's, it'll be fun. He's like 12 years old oh, well. and you would never know. He acts like a kitten. Yeah. Yeah. You're ridiculous. Okay. Yeah. So I, I know we, um, we didn't hit even everything yesterday. What, what were some of the outliers? Uh, trying to think here um well the oh, only thing, the, lettuce would be a big one that you guys haven't talked about yet lettuce yeah, that and brassicas would be the big ones okay so yeah. lettuce is actually a pretty, pretty easy simple. one because lettuce is really in that same category <laughs> as tomatoes and uh, uh beans you're like so it's a little different gradation but you're three to eight meters between varieties Okay. The nice part about lettuce, though, is you can actually do lettuce staggered. staggered, right? Because it's quick enough. Yeah. The hard part with lettuce, so the actual saving seeds is not that hard um, because they don't take a lot of space. And, you know, getting them even just the three meters isn't too bad. The hard part is when you're saving them, you have to do some thought about selecting the plants that you want to go to seed because one of the negatives of lettuce is wanting to bolt too quickly so it depends on your variety but you almost end up holding out for the best looking specimens and yeah. not harvesting them so you're kind of forfeiting that plant or those couple plants right okay so don't from... take the one that bolts first and be like yeah yeah done. yeah, yeah. That yeah. Was good. That, <laughs> breeding that to be a trait of yeah. the lettuce in the future so you, you basically right. so it's the same concept right like with the tomatoes you want to take the perfect the best fruit um in the case of the lettuce you want to let the plant that looks like the best representative of that variety and you probably want a couple i yeah. forget that they they're not super problematic as far as inbreeding like you can do it from one but a couple is better yeah but uh yeah so it's like the reverse it's you're better off to let those perfect ones go to seed and uh <laughs> eat all the kind of crappy looking ones that don't grow right and over time it will get better now it's uh the bolting is often a, it's a heat thing like a heat stress uh, response or a well, or just triggers them into wanting to. Heat, heat has a huge part of it because it, most lettuce varieties don't like the heat. There are some that are, have been selected for really low bolt uh, capacity, I guess, and those ones are almost problematic because getting them to go to seed period can be can be an issue. Um, yeah. But but you can have other stressors, right? Like uh, 
crowding, uh, lack of water, those those things can cause it too. So if you had, let's say, 20 lettuce plants or something, which isn't unreasonable, you would just kind of watch them and you you'll see fairly quick. You always get a you always get some outliers that they grow great right from the beginning, and you get others that just never really amount to much. Eat the ones that don't amount to much and let those real nice looking ones. Yeah, uh, like we usually we usually allow four or five, like we usually plant say 20 of the whatever variety, and we allow sort of four of them to go to seed. Yeah, and then that right, gets right. you all the seeds you would need for over the winter, the next season, everything usually. Mm -hmm. and do you so harvest the whole head, or do you pick leaves? Yeah, the whole for, flower bit comes out the top. You, so you're pretty much when for the ones you're going to save for seed, you're pretty much forfeiting that plant. Yeah, you now right. saying that I still take the greens off of them a little, a little bit. A little bit. You, you do. You yeah. don't want to make it that the plant doesn't keep going well, but yeah. right. like. Uh, for example, romaine lettuce. Last year, the ones that we allowed to go to seed just kept producing and producing and producing. And I just kind of, once it got to a certain point, I just was like, "Oh, I'll take a few off of it." And it didn't well, it hurt got it. it got the seed head up, and they didn't. They didn't, go, didn't um, go bitter. Bitter, yeah. It was yeah, really right. interesting. So I'm glad that I saved seeds from those one because I was yeah. able to still harvest it later in the year, and it wasn't bitter. But. The big thing, good. the big thing with lettuce is, so these are all generalizations, but there's again, so much diversity in different types that are different colors, different speeds of growth, different bolt mm -hmm. resistance, et cetera. Right. And different flavor too. Like some of them yeah. have been bred for more of that spicy flavor that most people don't like, but some people do. So yeah, it's not hard to do it. It's just, you kind of have to know a little bit of, what that variety is supposed to look like and what's the yeah this year's going to be experimenting a lot with the lettuce because i know my favorite type i don't have i, I never remember what it's called until i see it which is too bad because it wasn't in the vessies catalog this year so i think we're probably just going to buy a whole bunch of lettuce and try as right. much as possible and try to and, figure and out what we actually like that's something that we've done in the try past butter year. crunch butter that's crunch. it that's it that's I the one have, i think we have one did we have a butter crunch somewhere. is it a different one I think we have at least. I know that's that one of that. I probably like blew out the audio. <laughs> <laughs> that's my favorite. It does not bolt very quickly, so you get a long season of picking a lot of leaves off of them. I love butter crunch. Takes yeah. a little yeah. longer to grow than leafy lettuces, but oh, it's so good. Yeah. Well, and the nice no, part of lettuce too, because you 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 tend to do like the succession planting anyways, right? So you can use that to your advantage to space them out a little bit over time too i would still say definitely maintain your three meters apart but yeah you know three to eight's a big difference if you're spacing them out over time as well then i would say just do the three and I, you'll see a rougher approach rather than you know less managed and it's basically they just have i've seen it in a large pot and they harvest some and then just lightly sprinkle more seeds like consistently and they're just all different ages all mixed yeah. in there and they're just yeah. grabbing constantly that seems um, like chaos. It I think is I chaos. would get stressed out. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, what is it? What's the seed yield on, on heads of lettuce? Um, uh, I'm thinking for microgreens, you need a lot of seeds. Yeah. Um, That's another thing probably, you want to do. They're probably but. not the best for microgreens. Uh, yeah. They're decent. You get quite a bit. But um, I, I the one that I think is the most promising is the kale and cabbages. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It also, I guess, we we're, we're just deciding what we define as micro. Because like, I also think... Some things like yeah, oh, things like growing that too, uh, think, like starts when everything is yeah. you know still perfect and you know when you start to see it and everything's super happy and it's growing perfectly and before I have a time you know chance to mess it up yet yeah you know cut yeah it, that's cut it, what we eat it and uh, mean. make ten of those instead of yeah. uh, one that I mess up later on and it bolts and tastes like bitter. for, for that purpose you would, get, you would get a lot um, yeah there's okay oh. what's wow. up. So, this is our romaine oh, lettuce from last year. Yeah. So, so that is one. Wow. And what I do right now when I'm I'm planting stuff is I just grab one of these. I don't know if I'm close enough that you can see it. There's like the little seed ball that forms. Yeah. yeah. I take one of those and I crumble it up and you get about eight to ten seeds in one of those. Yeah. Right. So it's a lot of seed. The one downside to lettuce and seeds collection is it's a little bit labor intensive. You can't uh, just shake it like coriander. No, no, you, you gotta kind of rough to, it up. 
And okay. the problem is the seeds are so small. Uh, the seeds are <laughs> the seeds are so small that we haven't really found a good way to you know do the whole kind of bulk and then separate the chaff from the seed because right yeah. basically is like the chaff. Uh, that being said, it, you can sit down in an evening uh, while you're doing something else and yeah. you can process. Yeah, you can process a lot, like a lot <laughs> in yeah. that time. So, and another part is. Like that's from last year. We haven't processed it yet. You have a long shelf life on those seeds. Yeah. You know, yeah. We have are dry. So yeah, okay. we need like more storage somehow. <laughs> we we actually like do. twice the size of the house and we're like out of space already. So we actually on the lettuce, we hang a lot of it. Mm. And so because it doesn't seem to just come out super freely, uh, we just hang them upside down, like bring them in pretty much dry, but they'll yeah. finish doing a little bit of extra drying. Hang them up. The other thing is cats love them. I don't know why, but hanging yeah. them keeps the cats from destroying it all because they eat it, rip it up, everything else. It's uh, really, uh, I don't get it because it's dry, nasty plant material, but they seem to love it. I know why it is because you gave them the dried out cannabis plants. I nah, that'll do it. And then they got into the habit of anything dried is going to be delightful. No, they were doing the lettuce before. <laughs> well, the cats are eating our um, our pussy willow display. Yeah. Um, and getting like making themselves sick. Um, <laughs> uh, so, they're so dumb. Yeah. Sometimes they're really dumb. Um, this is a good question. I'll be right back. Somewhat yesterday, you guys alluded to black locust and how it was a touchy subject. What's the issue? Well, <laughs> For us, I, there's no issue. I love black locust. I am wanting to wow. plant more. Right on. I heard the honey is amazing. Anything that's like got a specialty honey associated with it is, is it, you know, obviously some people really like it. Um, mind you, goldenrod honey is a thing. And then like a lot of people, the fall honey isn't their favorite because it's kind of got that bitter kind of thing going on. And it smells like goldenrod. And I don't mind the smell, but the, the bitterness kind of throws me off. Um, so black locust, uh, it grows very strongly. Um, which is a benefit. And uh, if you don't want it there, it's a big problem. Uh, it grows from suckers. If when you chop the main tree down, it really grows from suckers um, a long way away from the tree if it's a mature tree. And it's a, it's a pioneer species. So it's trying to go into fields and turn it back into forest. And it does a really good job. So if you want your field to stay a field, you kind of have a problem. Horses, I think it can make horses very ill. Other animals, uh, less so, but some say to a still a degree. Um, it's got lots of uses. So for me, it outweighs then kind of the negatives, as long as you manage it, plan for how you're going to deal with those suckers and that it's not just going to turn into a thicket, um, of thorny black locust suckers. But it's one of those excellent sort of permaculture plants. Yeah. That in the, I'm going to say it in the wrong situation can go rampant. <laughs> yep. uh, I, I, I don't want to use the term invasive because it's not, technically native to Ontario, for example, but it's not that far off. It's so, it's called invasive, even like officially in some of its native range, which I find yeah. funny. It's got it. Yeah. It's like, it's like uh staghorn sumac, right? That has yeah. that same connotation. Once it's there, it's probably not going anywhere until the environment succeeds, which is like you say, what it wants to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, like, we're really excited about it. Like everything we read, like we'll, we'll read like cons, but we're like, but that is that is a thing that can be managed. I mean, like there's cons to everything. Like, really, I mean, it's there will so, be escaping suckers that pop out onto the side that we'd prefer they didn't. Yeah. Um, and but we're we will just going to have to brush hog them. And I know they like they can grow really fast. Those suckers. Um, okay. Like I've seen pictures, and this was like the worst case scenario. It was a full mature tree chopped down in someone's yard, and then all the houses around them on their perfectly manicured lawns. And you can tell they just mowed it like a day or two before. And it was like perfect. And, and no coming. outliers coming up on the grass. And there was like a one foot <laughs> sucker sitting on top of it. Yeah. Um, so like it's very it, prolific. It's a little crazy yeah. at, at certain points. But again, yeah. I'm not going to let the trees get that big. I'm going to be chopping them at four to eight inches wide. Uh, yeah. Kind of fence post, firewood, um, and, and building material. Well, I was going to say, so does, does the black locust produce a pod like the honey locust? Uh, no. Because that's what our sheep love to eat, the pods it's, off the it, honey locust. It does it's produce a pod. Not the same as the honey locust. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, because the honey locust wasn't the part really that you well. Probably yeah. No, the uh, black locust, my understanding, actually does work really well as a sheep fodder because of that. You can, it's a tree that you, like you said, you can basically cut it, not every year, but you can cut it and uh, sort of feed the greenery too. Oh, okay. Yeah. That yeah. And you'll giant. hear that it's, that animals don't do well with it and that it can poison them and kill them. I think horses, that's probably the most true. Yeah. But uh, they also want horses, to die. But, yeah, horses like, are trying to kill themselves all the time, like, but um, I mean, yeah, but I think for for sheep and goats, I've heard enough uh, people saying that they feed it, and none of them have said they've had an issue. So, um, well, there's a, there's a lot of I'm going to say this from quite a few years of experience with goats and 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 sheep. Um, there's a lot of plants, and I, and I I'm going to say this cautiously, but there are a lot of plants that are sort of considered poisonous or shouldn't be eaten that they will actually choose to eat. Mm -hmm. yes. I think the, right. problem, the problem with with uh, goats in particular, but sheep as well, at least I find with the Icelandic sheep, is they do have that bit of a browsing drive. So it's not... Yeah. I know some cows do that too, but most cows don't. They're more grazers. Um, so they tend to eat it at certain times of the year, certain foods. So I think the problem could come from this is where sometimes the science works against us collectively but, you know experimental feeding to see how does something do on a on a steady diet of of uh you know milkweed fodder or black locust fodder uh the results may not be fantastic but when the animals are given the opportunity and i say it with caution because there still are plants that are actually yeah deadly, deadly. Yeah. but there's a lot of plants that fall into this gray area that if they choose to eat it, our look on that is okay. It's whatever because you they have the op it. you have the option out on a on a larger <laughs> pasture to uh, milkweed was the best because there were certain times of the year where the goats would target it. Yeah, That's what they were going yeah. for it. they were they were passing up all the other forage that's supposed to be better. But then there's other times of year where they don't target it. Uh, we find that with wild parsnip as well. Oh yeah, that when the wild parsnip is young in the spring. Everything, That's... everything eats it. Yeah. Once yeah. Not, the horses. Snip, not the horses. No, not a lot. They, <laughs> yeah. they we're eating it. When a lot of plants, they're, they're more mild, I guess, when they're young and yeah. then they and get the, the plants it. protection of being bitter and gross tasting kind of comes in later. Yeah. It, exactly. And so once they started to develop the seed head then everything just yeah didn't touch it, but uh, yeah. Uh, James got a good comment here, um, and I, I would say that's probably it's one used of commercially for that the yeah. best uses for that tree in general across the world. So I don't know if you talked about the uh, Hungarian angle. I been might working. have mentioned it, but the the um they are used for mine reclamation. So like they've stripped the entire land, and uh, they need to hold it together and try to turn it into something. Uh, you know can sustain life on it again. Yeah. Like if you and, take uh, the Google walkie man and go to like any rural area in Hungary, you're going to find these black locust plantations and they are so cool. And like, you just like, well, it's, Google, yeah, it's everywhere. Like, oh, that's it's a large is. part of their forestry program is black locust. Yeah. Um, outside yeah and, and for us, the able to produce fence posts and, and building materials that are anti rot, um, supposedly more so than cedar. Um, and it's a lot harder than cedar, which has its own challenges when you're trying to, you know, cut into it. But, it. Yeah. <laughs> and the thorns and stuff. So there, it's got, it's got challenges, but um, so for us, the, uh, the use of, of the fence posts is a big one. And uh, we're thinking, well, worst case scenario, if we're not selling the fence posts or, or using the fence posts, it's firewood and it does burn very hot. Um, some say too hot um, and can kind of wreck your stove if you're burning just black locust. But that's why we're gonna kind of uh, burn it with some with some yeah. kind of crappier wood and uh, mix yeah, it together exactly. with willow or poplars or uh, something like that. Um, yeah. So for us, it, it was kind of it just made sense to do, and we're still going to um, run animals and tractors in between the the rows. Um, so it's it, it, you're not even really sacrificing the land so much. Um, mm -hmm. You still run the animals through. There's a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, I see. I see one too had the comment about uh, like the roadsides. Um, that's that same thing. There's a lot of plants. Some of them maybe shouldn't be planted, but there is a lot uh, that uh, they have their use in those kind of um, heavily disturbed areas. 
some of them are native. Like sumac, sumac is surprising. I, and I have a lot of experience with uh, roadside, <laughs> roadside mm -hmm. ecology, and uh, sumac, uh, staghorn, and smooth sumac in particular are fascinating because there's parts of the GTA, for example, in Ontario that uh, there really aren't native woody plants growing along the side of the road for the most part. And those are two that actually outcompete a lot of the introduced species, which are better adapted for an urban environment. Well, so then choke, choke cherry. Yeah, that's another, another, that's another good one. Choke uh, cherry jelly. Mm. That's actually a plant we want to, uh, we, we, we have some on our property. We want to, Kind of spread it a little bit because it is kind yeah. of for us. Okay, he's going to the library. <laughs> um, Have a good night. It's good getting night. yeah, it's getting late for some people. We had um, for plant propagation. We're getting into the you know perennial type stuff. Uh, the this, textbooks are this out. This is the, the book textbooks are that out. I cut into. Like I've got like frayed pages and pages falling out, and I'm sticking in there. Uh, this I think it's just a textbook. But it's um, this is the book that I'm constantly opening, and mainly the very back of it, right in there, and it get has a lot of detail on how to all the different ways you can propagate. And mainly, it's not just telling you how to do it; it's saying uh, um, this nursery says that this exact technique works. So it's all okay. the little nursery secrets. Yeah. that you know people aren't really sharing so they got what this information sorry yeah what it, i couldn't quite read the hartman's and kester plant right propagation that, that looks like a good one to have in the library yeah Hartman and the majority of the book is is techniques um one so it's actually a very good book in its own right but uh, i'm always in the back of it um and if what i can't find it in the one do book do i find it in this one you guys need to do this as well. But one thing we said, we need to figure out how to do the uh, Amazon affiliate link stuff. For yes. All the yes. <laughs> yes. All this stuff. Like we're going to go after the thing to Amazon and look up that book, you know, like we need yeah. to figure out how to do it. Yeah. 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 I mean, and we have a book for everything. I mean, like, and people, it's so funny because like people will text me or message me and they're like, Hey, I need to know about this and grafting this, or how do we do this? And I'm like, I don't know but I know he knows. And if he doesn't know, then the books know. So it's like, okay, give me a bit. So I'll this, get back to you. This is the one that most people have and it's yeah. a great book. And I open it almost as much as this other one. Uh, but most people that. have this um, one. Um, I'll see if I can find. But when I'm looking at really obscure things, it's often not in this one. It's in this uh, thing. In that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's rare that I can't find a really obscure, weird thing that I, I wonder about propagating between these two. That's I think it's rare I've had to go elsewhere. <clears throat> Are you getting a link? Yeah, Hester's <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of reference books, but the, certainly the propagation one is is a uh, a common one. Uh, this one. Oh my god! Oh, you're on the mouse. I'm like I'm on the mouse, and he's on the mouse. I'm like, what is going on? Oh yeah, I'll come back. Um, we we don't have enough, so we're running off of kind of a crappy laptop right now. And um, we don't have enough USB slots. So if we have to plug the mic and the camera in, then we have to unplug the keyboard. <laughs> so then we don't have the keyboard. So then we have to like go over to the laptop keyboard. Um, it's probably a silly system. But here we go. But yeah, it's, it's good because um, they can't, it's such a complicated topic that people haven't really figured out. And what they have figured out, they don't share. So, it goes through and it says it might have four oh. examples under on a specific uh, thing you're trying to propagate. And it says this nursery says that they've had success, this percentage of, of success um, doing it exactly this method and with a heat source or without a heat source and then a greenhouse or not. And with this much uh, um, hormone or not. Um, and, uh, and then it goes through like three other things. Um, and some of them are contradictory. So sometimes you get, you know, there's multiple ways to do it. Multiple ways to do it. Um, yeah. But as, I mean, I think we're all, we can all agree we're the kind of people that we get that answer all the time. Yeah. And you know, that's not actually an answer. Yeah. So anytime someone's like, nope, I'm like, are you sure? Well, and even things that you can't, <laughs> um, they say you can't propagate certain ways. You can, yeah. it's just perhaps not efficient. Yeah. Yeah. So they, it tells you ways people have had success. And it says, if you do this really complicated thing, you might get, you know, 30% success rate. 
And then maybe that's fine if you only want to get a certain number. Is yeah. if you're going to run a business on it, you probably do it a different way. But yeah, well, that's you really want a specific tree. A lot of the research misses the small producer and the small scale person. I was just going to say that because that's a big thing. It's like it's like grafting, right? Most people un, they don't necessarily know how to do it, but they understand the concept that they're all clones and that clone has whatever characteristic. And if you graft in these certain ways, you can produce like untold numbers of that one plant. Yeah. But like you said last night, there are other ways to produce apples. There are other ways to clone apples. There are other, they just may not be commercially viable. And I think that's like the micro cloning. Um, yeah. That, that's one where a lot of times if you can't actually do it by uh, hardwood or softwood cuttings, you can often do it by those, you know, the itty bitty, you know, teeny tiny ones. And it, and it does work, but like who has the lab equipment at home to, to do that. it? I mean, like me in college, but yeah. um, a lot of people not. So, because they, I think they they even they root them on agar um, for a lot. I, of these, yeah, yeah, I have seen that for some things. Yeah, I've never yeah. tried that, but obviously, right. but, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it'd be, it'd be cool to uh, to try out though. Yeah, air yeah. layering. Yep. Yeah, that's a good way to get um, fruit trees onto uh, you know its own its own roots. <laughs> I was saying to one too, we'll just dig up some of the we we pull out the sumacs and cut them down everywhere. You might we'll be just, able to transplant some. Trans be... We'll just try because we still have the box from the raspberries, even. Yeah, it. I mean, it survives. I've I've uh, transplanted it before, really, really <laughs> brutally, where I've literally just pulled it to the ground and shoved it in, and it, it worked. Back in so and it did work. <laughs> yeah, there first. you go. This is your new home. Actually, now. the the air laying air layering is interesting oh, to me because I can. Um, I've been thinking about ways of, of getting our own uh, root stock. Um, yeah. But yeah, if I let uh, a sucker on the one tree that's going to get chopped down just grow, I mean, I could just uh, graft onto it from the top onto that little mm -hmm. sucker and call it a new tree. Um, but if I can, if I can air layer a root stock, then I can be producing my own root stock. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then, you know, grafting onto it constantly because that is always the question: is how do I get them onto like um, dwarf root stock? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, that's something that drives us nuts. I mean, when I like that, I just can't. Oh, it's it's frustrating because that's one of those ones where you start looking at planting your trees, and we're like, well, if we don't want the giant trees in certain spots, and and even if you do, I mean, just the fact that it's a tree that's on the root stock, I mean, that is not sustainable. That is not something we can replicate very easily, and it just drives me nuts because anytime I I can recognize that in a system, I don't want to go near that system. I don't want to. I'm like, no, no, stop. Yeah. You know, I know and I mean, it's, and we, and we have to do it. And I mean, it, to a certain extent, you kind of got to be like, all right, we'll put in a lot and we'll pray. But I mean, if there's, you know, some big catastrophic event, I don't think it's going to matter what end of the orchard it's in. I mean, you know, we yeah. have to have other things up our sleeves, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. That's why we're looking at the Siberian crab apple because yeah. those trees grow fast oh, and really well. The... Yeah, there we have a cultivar of. Yeah, I forget what no. the cultivar is, but yeah. And, and I, know I like crab apples. I know there's a pear, and there's an easy, you know, seed run thing you can grow for pear that you can use as a root stock. Um, yeah. That's got the disease resistance, but it's also it's still a big tree. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, being able to create your own dwarf stuff would be good, and I think air layering is perhaps the, uh, the, the way to do that. Way to do that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's something. Uh, I've not really experimented too much with no. a bit of accidental on uh, currents and stuff, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And see that, that, that's the thing too. Like we don't, I don't know. Some of that is probably even niche to the homesteading with like within the homesteading, you know, um, I don't think everyone feels quite as strongly as we do about the sustainable well, end of things. You know, they're like, I've got my chickens. I'm good. And I'm like, but the feed store, you well, know, I, like think, I think too, when you get into the woody plants, this is maybe a generalization, but like we've gone through the top, a lot of topics about annuals and biannuals and they're accessible because there's a quick return. Right. But there isn't for, for most homesteading mindsets, the return on the woody plants isn't quick. Yeah. Even though some of them, some of them are, but yeah. it's not quick, right? So it's this longer term outlook on thing. And then you really do have to rely on information that you can glean from what others have done, because mm -hmm. like in the case of the Apple stuff, right? Like that's 
literally generations upon generations of passed down knowledge to build to the point where we can do those things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, I sound probably negative saying this, but I think that's hard for people to wrap their brains around, right? Because there's a lot there. You you kind of have to, like you said, you can't just get a couple. It's not like chickens where you can just have a couple chickens and you'll get eggs. It's like you actually, if you're going down that far, that sustainable, you you have to jump into the deep end eventually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's the whole anthropological. I mean, I, I'm really going to go off the deep end here, but there's the whole like anthropological side of all that too. I mean, I've been reading recently about fires and mm -hmm. and you know people and their use of fire and i don't think i even understood how much technology and knowledge had happened like a very i think it was something like sixty thousand years we had like I, I i that number's wrong that's wrong that's definitely wrong um i i'm gonna have to look it up i've got nothing to back it up but i was i was floored that there were multiple different types of stoves that like literal cave people were using you know like things like that and then you bring it all the way out and then we're literally creating like these different trees that go on other trees that produce very specific things and on one hand i'm like why am i trying to tear all that down and go backwards but on the other hand i mean doom so of course that's we why. have to go back a little bit you know what i mean um, the doom well and people so it's like i don't know the fire thing like i thought was interesting because i was like okay we've got all our stoves but like you know how far do we go because do i know how to make one of these like round barrel top with the thing the caveman was no i don't know how to do that well, like, if i had to like make fire outside of a stove i would just burn everything down i mean i you know well, here's it's, another thing when you bring up fire and, you know, we've just talked about black locusts and I'm going to say it's potential invasiveness, but also yeah. its usefulness and how there is a lot of like when you when you get into the the human impact on our environment. And I'm going to say that at the highest level. We've been moving species around, manipulating species and manipulating environments collectively for as long as we've been in those environments. And there's sort of this mindset right now that that's potentially bad like that yeah. is that is a prevailing and there is and i will say it there is scientific evidence to support that to a, to a point but then where do you draw the line you end up with this massive gray area where it's yeah. you and like, your gray area well, it's like the, it's like the black yeah. locust example right like you said it, it is actually listed as invasive or it's considered yeah. to have invasive growth ha growth habits and there's some areas where, you know, maybe it shouldn't be used and other areas where it's fine. like, it gets so complicated. Yeah. I think right. that's another part when you start getting into the, the longer term things, like, again, it's easier on, you know, tomato is the tomato likely to escape your garden and take over the, the, the world. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Like said tomato seedlings do pop up. So yeah. there is the potential there, but um, yeah. And you don't want to plant a black locust beside a sand trap and a golf course. I mean, like that's, that's <laughs> going to be a problem, you know, no, and I, I understand the warnings, but I mean, anytime someone says invasive, I'm always just immediately, I, I just want to <clears throat> deride and scorn the comment. <clears throat> what does that even mean? And what do we even, blah, and who even are we? And then people don't talk to me anymore. So, <laughs> I mean, I get, you know, I don't like those labels because it, like well, it's very, it's very hard, hard even from a biological or an ecological perspective, right? It's easy to put that label on it and then just deal with it in one way. But then uh, it's like um, the Phragmites australis, right? The common reed, which yeah, is yeah. a huge, I think that is a huge legitimate issue because of what it does to mm -hmm. wetland succession. But then you could make the argument that it's only a, an issue to wetland succession if you don't allow wetland succession to happen. Right. Yes. Or wetland. And then the other end is. Or forest succession for the black locust. Yeah. And yeah. the other end of it is the, is then if you look at the permaculture end of it, it's like, okay, but do we have an invasive species problem or do we have a lack of the species that would be dealing with that invasive species in its native habitat? So is there, is there such a thing as introducing a second invasive that will now suddenly deal with that first one i mean it's when well, you end up with you know, checks and balances because even in a way i'm going to go super deep here 
in a way, is permaculture really a good way to describe it? Because intrinsically, it's not permanent. Nothing yeah, yeah. in the nothing. Very few environments on the planet are permanent. Yeah. Even 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 in a, even in a human context of a couple generations, right? Yeah. Um, a, a permaculture forest, for example, is still a dynamic system which changes over time. Yeah. Players change where they are, and the system changes. Yeah. Like so, I think that's another part with this that gets even more complicated when you most say I, I it's the label thing again but most yeah. homestead, people are a homestead mindset right they're doing it to feed themselves is kind of the basic reason uh, maybe because of doom maybe because of something else yeah. but then when you start to go into the permaculture it's very attractive because when we get into the and this is another thing too permaculture often tends to downplay or a lot of permaculture mindsets downplay the annuals right it's like well you yeah. know perennials those yeah. annuals are still part of the system yeah but they yeah. make they're important they're yeah. important but they also you make spend a lot of time them. making them there's no reason to throw them out so fast yeah <laughs> exactly um but yeah you start to when you start looking at how long it takes to set these things in motion <laughs> how much knowledge it requires to sustainably like it's different from just planting cultivars to you know how do we keep it going uh right. it's it suddenly just it's mind they do how, they how do bring in and talk about the like the importance of disturbance and and how that plays into it yeah. um but yeah it's, it's not really um shown in the title of, of you know permanent yeah. I, know, I think it's hard too because disturbance is an interesting one like just looking at it this is again where you know the biology or the interest in birds come into play because we talk about this quite often with um i'm just going to say the term development just mm -hmm. imagine any kind of development you want in that notion but development tends to cause disturbance mm -hmm. well historically the human development, whether it was use of fire or construction of roads and buildings and whatever, or even conversion of areas to pasture land, that took time. That didn't happen. Okay, a fire goes through overnight, but yeah. it, it most of those things didn't happen overnight. That disturbance wasn't a, a quick dramatic effect. Even a lot like of the, is now. even a lot of the fires historically weren't actually the horrendous disturbances that we see now because of fire suppression right you you didn't get that accumulation so like the tall grass prairies for example they burnt multiple times in a year in a lot of cases and yeah. it didn't cause the same uh i'm grasping for words but that same horrendous disturbance yeah um, and i think yeah that's where it's hard because permaculture implies by its very name that even though the disturbance is important that you're kind of fixing it, but you still have to have the disturbance as part of the system to keep some of like, Yeah. It's yeah. You can see the, 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 the X just goes around. Well, you know, yeah. yeah. And I try, when it comes to permaculture, I try to like, anytime we're planning something or looking at a new garden or a new thing or a new way of doing anything, I, I try to look at it through a permaculture lens mm -hmm. versus because we always are opted to, you're opted where we're, we're I think just growing up with the way most of us did here, you look at it through the monoculture lens first, whether you know you're doing it or not. Hmm. So I try to flip it and then look into the permaculture side. And typically we land somewhere in the middle. Like if yeah. we're, if we're planning something new, we're not one or the other. We, I mean, we really end up somewhere in the middle. And I, I think it can there be are benefits to straight lines. They're not applicable to all situations. And then you're maintaining certain things. But like a lot of things, there's maintenance involved in even permaculture stuff. Um, oh, exactly. You have a very widespread, uh, like large scale swale and you don't manage it. It's going to break out at some point. And then you've got an entire mountainside that's getting all the water captured and it's breaking out here and it's going to start creating a ravine and, uh, you know, things snowball. So, yeah, oh, exactly. Um, and I, and I find, I mean, and this is probably a dangerous topic, but I mean, we're on doom. So why not? Um, the, I, I find that sometimes permaculture, the same way that monoculture does, can can attract zealots on one side or the other. So you'll get, and I mean, we've met the monoculture crazies, you know, that get really mad that you're doing something on like two acres and they're like upset and affronted that you're not just like letting the potato guy till your field. And, 
you know, like those people are, they're a thing to deal with, but then sometimes the other side with the permaculture stuff too, it, it can be a lot to deal with. You know, it's like, it well, why have awesome. donated all of your salary to this cause and then done this? And I'm like, because then I and wouldn't it, be growing it. Can be it can be off-putting to people too, right? Because yeah. they just go, I can't, I can't achieve that. Yeah. And yeah, that's a, it's too much too fast. And I mean, like, I think we've converted a few people to permaculture here and there, but we've started with like really small concepts, like mm -hmm. really little. And it's usually <laughs> starting with like, if we can't fight nature, like if, if we won't win, then what do we do? Oh, it was the slugs. It's always, I always use the slugs and the ducks. Like you don't yeah, have a slug problem, you have a lack one. of a duck problem. And then they're like, yeah, duck deficiency. <laughs> oh, you know? And I mean, like that's, and I mean, like I've, I've tried to apply concepts like that to places where they don't belong and it doesn't always work out well. But um, I mean, in general, like I find it interesting, like, do you really have a problem or do you have the absence of something? Like I like the, the I don't know, the thought exercise can be interesting. Um, yeah. Now with um, invasive species, I don't know, this is something I heard, I don't know how true it is, but I had asked if, um, like, of course, here we hear about uh, European and Asian species coming over and then running rampant and kind of uh, kicking our plants' butts. And I wondered if it was the same in reverse. And the answer that I got was that it's not really, not to the same extent. And it was something, the reason they gave me was that the plants east have been... Um, around people and heavy human disturbance for such a great deal of time that when they come over they uh the native species in in, Amer in the americas can't really I, haven't done that fast enough see i think it depends so i know i think i know the where that kind of thought's coming from is a lot of the for like some of the forest work right because mm -hmm. go back to the industrial revolution in england for example and i know uh, or in europe uh, like a common tree of two common trees that you see a lot in urban settings in Ontario, at least are Siberian elm and uh, European ash. Both of those species do fit that model. Exactly what you're saying. They had to deal with excessive amounts of air pollution, if nothing else. So they are better adapted for it than say a sugar maple, which yeah. hasn't had to deal with that, but I'm not sure that, it's a hundred percent accurate because I think this is where invasive, the, the term invasive species gets really complicated because it's really case by case. Like I'm going to go to something that's not a plant, but look at Canada geese, Canada geese. We are familiar with them here in North America. They're kind of everywhere. Well, they have been taken to many, many countries around the world and they've done exactly what, some species have done here. They've done yeah. exceptionally well. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, they do exactly what some species do. They push out other species and just monopolize environments. The so, humans. <laughs> well, so it, there, is, there are examples, uh, and it's another, not a plant, but it's like beavers, right? The North American yeah. beaver in South America is kind of a growing concern because, uh, yeah. yeah, they are. Just everywhere. They're yeah. spreading like wildfire down there where the, it's just the environment is not adapted for them so they i think that's where it gets i think that's where it gets hard with invasive species because when you get to the point i'm going to pick on i'm doing animal examples because i think they're, <laughs> they they're good though and they're, they're easy to digest for people so i think it's yeah. i think it's good because i think the plant ones are hard because there's other interconnections going on but look at round gobies in the great lakes yeah have a that's species a good one. that yeah. is or well, even go further zebra mussels in the great lakes yeah. you have a species where there is no equivalent to it in the environment it comes in is perfectly adapted for temperature you know all the parameters are excellent and it would have never it would have never physically been able to make the jump from point a to point b on its own yeah. because it's aquatic and you know there's no pathway there yeah but when you have a species especially when they're low on that uh trophic level and they come in and they can monopolize an environment yeah. so rapidly. I think that's where something truly should have that label because yeah. those have a tendency, they can change oh, yeah. trophic levels in that <clears throat> environment of the Great Lake. Pick, pick a Great Lake. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you are in that Great Lake. Zebra mussels have changed it like yeah. across yeah. the board. 
versus another example that I'm going to use is the European or the Eurasian common carp. They actually do for this is controversial, but they do exist in some environments in North America where they're not native, uh, but they have competition. They don't have the ability to fill every niche in those environments because you still have a reasonably intact ecosystem. On the flip side, if you put them in an environment that is devoid of those connections, then yes, they no be just as invasive. So you, you, you really run the gamut. And yeah. I think... You look I, at I think that's probably the, the carp's probably a good example of uh, they're the slug, and you don't have necessarily the carp problem. You have a lack of their predator problem. But then again, you go into the zebra mussels, and so you just have a problem. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't because exist, there's nothing so. that you can add or change, or there's no way you can influence it for for better. Um, unless you unless you introduce uh, round gobies, which are the natural predator, and then of course right. they change the trophy. You just, yeah. you just take the whole ecosystem yeah, they yeah. came from and just transplant yeah, it. Yeah, just be and like they can they can sort it out. Here we there. go. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It's like uh, yeah, because the gobies are interesting too. The last time I went fishing on Simcoe, I got one by accident, and you know, a coworker of mine is like, "Yeah, you got to kill that now," and I'm like. Well, that seems dumb. It's like two inches long. And he's like, it's literally not legal to put it back. Like you have to, you have to kill it. Um, we, we run into that because if you're doing any kind of fish sampling in the, in like Lake Ontario or Lake Erie, you're going to encounter thousands of them. And if yeah, you were yeah. to take a seine net full of thousands of gobies out of the lake and dispose of them, it's still not going to do anything. <laughs> like, yeah, it does not matter. Yeah. Yeah. Canada geese. That's funny. Yeah. Only, only thing Canada tougher geese. than Canada gooses are Canada mooses. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently we have, so, so we live in moose and bear country now, which we've never, well, I guess you've lived in moose and bear country, but I haven't. Um, and we have, so we're really close to this like uh, wide joint in the river and there's a bridge and stuff. And there's, this little collection of houses and i guess there's been a moose who's hanging around uh, this big mama moose they're assuming she's got a baby in there somewhere and um every once in a while i guess she like comes out and approaches the vehicles and i'm i'm a little weirded out by that i'm uh, i'm not used to huh. i'm not used to an animal that size being in my environment and that don't even started on the bear i mean i just haven't thought about the bear because it's been asleep yeah, um, yeah. yeah. and i'm a little bit like i i i don't know and i like I've spent time in bear country and I've, I've done those things, but I mean, like we spent more time thinking about the rattlesnakes and how to deal with the rattlesnakes and stuff, not bears. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just the, the ecology of all of it's very interesting and it just changes. Well, here, here's everything. a question for you on, on bears uh -huh. and, and hibernation in primary school, they teach you that bears sleep all winter in a cave and that's how it happens. And then I'm wondering where the hell are all these caves? You think I'd be bumping into caves left, right, and center, and for the amount of bears that are around? Are they are they sharing these caves? Are they all just? It's always one bear in a cave snoring. That's <laughs> how it was taught. So I'm I'm wondering how how asleep are they really, and where are these caves? So <laughs> well, and then we found out, and they're not necessarily in caves. Well, no. Uh, yeah. So they're so for one, they're not. Um, they're not really hibernators. So right, right. they're groggy, but they will wake up. They can be woken <laughs> up. So a, a true hibernator, and this is kind of one of these things that is also case by case, has to lower its metabolic rate to a point that you couldn't just wake it up, right? Mm -hmm. I think the, the analogy is like a groundhog. That's right, a true right. hibernator. If you dig it out of its den, you could play hockey with it. And it won't wake up. <laughs> That'd be worthy of a video, I think. Well, I don't think it would be your last I don't video. Recommend, on I don't recommend anybody try it, but that is. I, I've come too far in this idea. I'm, I'm, I'm doing it in my head right now. <laughs> but in the case of, of case of a black bear, they will wake up. Um, they're. It all depends on their fat reserves and stuff too, as to how awake they may be, and if they run out of them early. <clears throat> they will leave. Now, as far as where they'll hibernate, it depends. If they've got access to a cave or something like that, obviously they would use it. Um, but they will, I believe if you've got the right soil, they can excavate a den 
Don't they go like if you get a tree that yes. falls over in the yeah, roots? Yeah, that one I knew They about. go underneath into the roots under the What usually turned? happens, like okay. I know in some areas of, of northern Ontario for sure, where you get that, you'll get the snow cover and they're just under the snow. Yeah. And basically like a little mini igloo. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, I've always heard of them going into people's trailers too. Yeah, or under houses. That's another you know, one. They're like, oh, I'm just going to sleep yeah. here. And, and since I've got uh, Chris the Encyclopedia here, um the the other thing that was bugging me because i didn't know what the deal was was um and i'm sure it's different between you know different groups of people but native americans in the winter when i when we go there and we see the different buildings and the and the the stuff they use for their way of life it's always summer and i'm thinking of the horrible winters we have and the drifts and the giant snow piles and i don't i haven't seen one shovel I don't know what they do to clear the snow out. And like, you think that it'd be like, you know, there'd be pictures of them shoveling out the, the common areas. And, but I, I haven't heard anything about winter, which is half a year. So, so I'm, I have a big gap in knowledge. I'm definitely not an expert on the subject <gasps> and it's, well, it's, it's a, it's a big subject, but yeah. I know, yeah. I do know depending on where in, north america you are a lot of it had to do with seasonal movements to places where it was it's like oh, oh. i'm gonna i'm gonna, I'm gonna re, i don't i'm not making the analogy but it's like it's like wait till deer right when they yard up they go to locations that don't accumulate <coughs> as much snow uh or that have access to areas that don't so it's the same you do have you did have microclimates and some and then you and some they communities moved quite a bit uh pending yeah um, <laughs> And it also would depend a lot on sort of uh, if they were like, if it was a more agronomic community versus. Um, or they could have just been like us. We don't shovel anything. We just keep walking on it. Just, yeah. You just yeah. go yeah. higher up in the area. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Off yeah. To the side and <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah the, really, the paths I mean, get more narrow. It's, it's all just a shovel's width. We really only yeah. move the snow so we can get the vehicles in. Exactly. That's Otherwise, the only thing. Really snow the driver. And that's actually there. something you, you can yeah. go back. You, you don't have to go back that far to European history. Sh shoveling it and plowing it out of the way wasn't the most common technique. Mm -hmm. It was actually compacting it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I've seen some of the, the gadgets for that. Yeah. And that was basically the same thing. Like you say, that's to get horses down it with yeah. sleighs yeah. and whatnot. So, uh, yeah, our fight with it the way we do now is just because we have equipment that will do the work, do which kind of so goes back right. to the time thing, right? Because it's no different than the development. When you can take a fleet of bulldozers and level a hundred acre woodlot in like a week. Yeah. yeah. That's nothing, faster. Nothing, nothing can adapt fast enough. Nothing can move fast enough. Nothing can disperse fast enough nothing can end. it's gone right yeah, you're left yeah. with a void even if they even if it's a migratory bird it's coming back you did that in the winter that thing is coming back dependent on that environment and you just wiped that out and there isn't yeah, yeah. a lot of points in human history where we've ever been able to do that yeah, yeah. i guess they do show snowshoes maybe that's just the answer yeah, it should be fine i was gonna go back <laughs> to the in there sorry but um Dave had talked about, was it the flying carp? Is that the ones that are coming up the canal? Yes. The, and haven't broke into the waters well, yet, but the, it, every time <laughs> the canal, it's... That's the, well, that's the ones that they talk about. They call them collectively the Asian carps. It's the big head and silver carp, which are used in a lot of Southeast Asia in aquaculture ponds because they have the different trophic levels for the carp. Okay. Um, yeah. So they do they, they're filter feeders and they feed near the surface and when you drive a boat through a school of them they tend to jump <laughs> hence the name so i again i'm not an expert on asian carp but my understanding of it is i, I there's no way that they will keep them out of the great lakes they do have the uh the electrified barriers but if we know anything about water if the water's flowing the fish will eventually go that way too what i think though will happen is because going back to the zebra mussels this is my prediction they will never establish the same way as they have in the mississippi basin because all you have to do is look at the mississippi river what color is it it's brown it's full of nutrients to filter feed what color are the great well lake ontario in particular or 
Erie is still a little browner. So yeah. A bit of a foothold, okay. but it's not as nutrient rich as it was, right? Okay. So I imagine they will become a part of the fauna, the lake fauna, but I don't imagine they will explode to the same level uh, that they are in other areas because they just don't have the food. I mean, Lake Erie used to have a filter feeder, the paddlefish. It went, even though the lake became eutrophic, it still disappeared. So. I was just curious if that was the ones that were yeah. coming up to the, yeah. the thing. The yeah. What other big invasive ones were there? Um, Gas carp's another one. That one's probably more likely to get a foothold because it actually eats yeah. like macrophytes, like growing plants. Yeah. But, yeah, man, the coyotes have done well. They have well, done. That's, a, that's, a, <laughs> that's an interesting one that has a lot of polarization and a, the science is so much. <gasps> oh, remember a few weeks ago, I remember I said I was awake for that live and I was like, we've got to talk to them about this sometime, about the red wolves, the Algonquin wolves you guys were talking about. Oh, yes. A that's few lives it, ago. That's so when we... Yeah, so when we lived in, um, we were near Hockley, so fairly far down, we had, and I wouldn't have believed anyone who told me this, because, and it happened, we were, like, working one of the fields, and uh, a co-worker of mine was like, I just saw a wolf, and I'm like, yeah, of course you did. Like, no one ever sees a wolf, it's never a wolf, so I was a coyote, whatever. And I friggin' turned around and looked at this thing, and I'm like, holy shit, that's a wolf! Because it was this big red wolf. And I mean, you know, if you know them, you know the instant you see them, because they've got, like, twice the amount of leg. They're totally built differently. And then a coyote runs out and it's like running with it. And yeah. we started like studying what was happening. And we had this little pack of coyote red wolf hybrids that were living completely like independently, like as this family unit um, to the point where if a, if a timber wolf, which we did have a very, like occasionally they'd be around, they would run them off. Like it was, it was the coolest. It was absolutely like, phenomenal to see it and it was so neat and anyone we told we're just like they're only in Algonquin and I'm like they're no, not. Mixing, they're not. like they're everywhere but it's not the timber wolves it's the red wolves well the koi wolf and the koi dog thing is interesting because they always say yeah. oh well it never happens I'm like but you know that it's x percentage of the genetic thing like so obviously at some point there's yeah. a 50 50 so like, someone you know, did it <laughs> you can so you the the Coles notes on the complexity of this um so Trent University did some genome studies mm -hmm. and of course they use like the trappers right so they had a pretty good data set yeah so i'm gonna go back for a second when i was younger we had um coyotes that were in the fields behind the house and they den back there and then these two what you would look at as timber wolves showed up and it was the same scenario. They were running with the pack, et cetera. And it was, everybody said, no, no, they can't do that. They can't cross this line, whatever. Well, they did. And yeah. what, so basically what Trent University discovered was um, coyotes and the timber wolves in of themselves aren't really that compatible. Yeah. But if you put in, and this is where it gets murky again, prior to Europeans coming to North America, the wolves that lived in the Eastern part of North America, which now are the red wolves in Texas and the Algonquin Canadian, whatever you want to call it, yeah, yes. in Algonquin, they've diverged a bit. So they're not genetically identical either, but they are the closest to the common ancestor between the timber wolf and the coyote. So they're like yeah. the gateway species. Yeah. But, yeah. And what basically they have been finding, and this goes back quite a few decades. And again, this is like Cole's notes version. <laughs> Cause it's kind of crazy. <laughs> it's a big topic. <laughs> when you have wolves, and it doesn't matter whether it's timber wolves or whether it's the, the red wolf, Algonquin wolf, whatever, the wolves, yeah. when they form a pack, breeding is controlled in the pack and it's only the alphas or maybe a couple of other high ranking individuals that get to have puppies and breed, right? Well, you can eradicate wolves because if you break their pack structure up, essentially, to put it bluntly, nobody knows what to do. Yeah. They just kind of get lost and they don't, it's very unlikely that they're going to reform a cohesive pack. Yeah. And what they've been finding in Algonquin, they even forget how to go to the areas that the, the deer and stuff winter in. So they yeah. really forget everything. Yeah. But if you bring the coyote into it, 
what will often happen is they'll form a pack with them. Yeah. And they'll end up being the dominant because they're yeah. bigger. So they end up passing the genes into the coyote group because if you, again, yeah. this is where it gets controversial, if <laughs> you can't eradicate coyotes, yeah. because what happens is if you leave them alone, they form a pack structure. Yeah. But, and you try to break up the pack structure, they all have puppies. Yeah. They, they yep. pair yep. off. Everybody has the puppies. harder you push, well, the, the harder the they carrying push capacity back. problem yeah. and the yeah. fact that coyotes yeah. fill it faster than other things can. It, yeah. And that has to do with their relationship because of isolation from the eastern wolf yeah. species with timber wolves, right? Because when timber wolves persecute them, they just reproduce faster. Yeah. But if you yeah, leave these hybrids alone and they will form packs and they will form a pack structure etc but it's it's extremely convoluted because when trent went through and did this these studies first of all they didn't expect to see the timberwolf genomes come up and they found yeah. that and actually where we live in the front neck access which is the link between the adirondacks and and the canadian shield was a hot spot for it so there was genetic crossing yeah, stuff, there. Yeah. um they also found domestic dog in some areas like so the the what it is <laughs> from a species perspective anymore in at least ontario is anybody's guess because you have yeah. they couldn't uh, basically when they looked at things like measurement of leg length and ear length and all these things that you would normally like like you say you could associate yeah. normally with eyeball yeah what's going yeah. on and they couldn't equate the there was no phenotype that equated back to uh the genetics yeah so it's, and really it's just so cool like i remember going through that study because like when i was a kid that was my big one is the wild canids i was like super super into that um and like i knew enough to dispel most of the myths that just you know fly around all the time and then the further we started getting into it and then we started seeing them and we could actually i mean that was it was really cool and they were bold I mean, they were both, but they weren't interested in, and I'm probably anthropomorphizing, but they had no real interest in anything that we had to offer as food. Like they weren't interested in our dogs. They weren't interested, like they would just want to pass by. They'd be curious, but the kind of whatever. And then we found that other groups of coyotes that didn't have that influence were a lot more like, we're going to pick at you and we're going to come in here and we're going to, you know, like it kind of mellowed them a little bit. Hmm. is what it seemed like but i think there's, we read that study the one out of trent because i knew it came out of trent there's, there's um, a lot of interesting stuff going on there yeah i had yeah, an interaction cool. with um ben falk because he posted uh um this whole tirade about uh, coyote hunting and how it, it's horrible and here's the studies and, and especially the uh the bounty systems and studies about the bounty and how it doesn't do anything and it's costing money and all that like i i you know believe it um, and it doesn't have the effect that they're going for. It's just, you know, spending money on people, you know, hunting coyotes. Um, but then I kind of came back with, uh, well, just the fact that it doesn't work and the numbers, you know, don't change because of carrying capacity and all that. Doesn't that just mean it's a perfectly sustainable fur harvest? And then he's like, well, well, yeah, I guess, I and guess so. so. That, that's my, <laughs> this is my opinion on it for yeah. what my opinion's worth. But if they're causing a problem, i.e. they're coming in and they actually are taking livestock. Uh, yeah. I have my own opinions on some cattle stuff, but I'm not going to go into that right now. But <laughs> if they're actually causing the problem, then obviously that's a concern to yeah. you know potentially get rid of those individuals. And if you are doing it for a sustainable fur harvest, I don't see a problem with it. But that's very different from trying to eradicate them. Yeah, yeah. the kill them yeah. all kind of yeah. mentality yeah, yeah. And, and the interesting thing with them too like as and we know more about like the canid stuff because we do all the dog stuff but um the studies back it up that with the coyotes you can actually dispatch certain individuals and essentially have your problem handled change the dynamic it's not all bit. of that coyotes it's no, that exactly. one asshole who knows that he can go get your lamb yeah. like that's you know that's your issue so yeah uh, well you you dispatched two at our last place and they hadn't it was a tough one because they hadn't they hadn't done anything yet, but there was two of them who had very sketchy behavior and the rest were fine. The rest were, I mean, they were kind of creepy, but they weren't, well, it was, you it know. It was uh, February and breeding season, so they were all extra bold and horned up and out, yeah. out in daylight. And they were, you know, our, our yeah. property's in the middle of a field, so they were in the field and you could yeah. see them all over the place. 
Um, but two were an issue and they were like realizing that there were ducks and chickens and they saw him standing on the porch and they're just like, okay, well, I shot, whatever. I shot the one and then right. I went and I, I wasn't, I could have shot multiple because they, they kind of were still there, but I only shot the one and I went and go to collect it. And um, I didn't bring the gun because I figured they think they're going to run off, but they were all still there. I walked right onto the field and I grabbed this thing. They're, they're, they're everywhere around me. I'm like, I should have brought the gun. <laughs> but I, I, I dragged the thing back and they, they kind of just watched me the whole time. But yeah, it was a little unnerving. All of a sudden, I'm like kind of, kind of surrounded. I mean, they were a distance away because it's a big so, field. But, uh, yeah, yeah, a little sketchy. And then he promptly scarred a UPS driver to, yeah, you know, he, for life, forever, because he, he's got this blood trail through the snow. It looked and then like he, he, it looked it like it came from the barn because I had to go past the barn. So like there's this blood trail like from the house. <laughs> it looks like it's from the house to the barn. Yeah. This bloody trail going there and the UPS guy is just watching me. Yeah. The best part too is we didn't, so we didn't consider the fact that one of our dogs was actually outside while Jack was skinning this coyote. And he was the, the jerk dog, the dog that, you know, I always would joke that I would turn him into a coat. Well, one day he watched jack like turn a coyote into a coat and i swear to god this dog was a perfect gentleman for three weeks yeah he was, <laughs> he was polite he was snuggly i don't know he like, was and he was not himself he was not himself at all it was I a mean, little it odd was, it was you wouldn't weird. think that that sort of connection could be made but he, he his behavior oh, did change he knew. <laughs> he's seen me kill other things but not i guess something that smells like uh like his uncle or something i don't know yeah he, yeah it was funny so, and this dog that we're talking about he's he's like the reason that we got into this field in general he's way too smart for his own good he was literally bred to be a lead sled dog and he would be very good at it because he's constantly like you're stupid and your decisions are dumb and i'm gonna do something smarter and then he does like he once locked me out of the house so that he could take a shit in the kitchen instead of outside where it was raining but he locked <laughs> me outside with no shoes on and then made eye contact while he did his business in the kitchen like it just this dog is ridiculous yeah. and he's great he's fantastic but i mean like every once in a while you just gotta skin a coyote in front of him i guess and <laughs> Put him yeah. in his place. Oh, Remind him who's the boss. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, I think we should we should wrap up here because we're yeah. we're uh, into lots of things that uh, oh, yeah. I'm sure that there's lots of conversations to be had. We didn't do we didn't do a very good job being earlier for you, even though we started an hour earlier. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's not tomorrow yet. No, that's true. So, that's true. Yeah, so that's true. yeah, it's still today here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's fun though. We just have so much to chat about. Oh, I know. I and mean, we went from. Well, we, there were some topics. We covered some topics. Yeah, well, and I was yeah. saying, um, I was saying uh, today about yesterday that you know we could have done a live on even just one part of that, and it still would have filled a couple hours. Oh uh, yeah. If there's not the yeah. constant, be like, oh, well, we got to try to get like more than just squash in. You know, we we we'd fill the time with with yeah. just the one thing. So yeah, it's yeah. Um, you can go really far down the rabbit hole with everything. That's the yeah, idea. yeah. Yeah, that's the fun part so, and the hard part when you're uh, <laughs> yeah trying to cover as much as you can. Yeah, I like the lies for this because, like, in the videos, I'm always trying to be like, okay, that's that information's not necessary. I need to cut that. I need to cut that. I need to cut that. And I'm always cutting my audio down, and I'm like, I've got so much to say. And then you know, in the lives, I'm just like, blah. <laughs> there you yeah. go. You get all of it. You know. But um, that's where it's really fun because you do get to know people. Like, I mean. But we've got people that follow follow us in our lives and that. And I think you get to know people from the videos, but the videos tend to be, like you say, more edited, more um, yeah. instructional, so to speak, or, or things like that. You know, you're trying to portray something useful. And that's where I like the lives because the real kind of character comes out. <laughs> yeah, what yeah. you get to know is what you see in the video, um, like how manicured and um, yeah. uh, created is that or not. Um, yeah. And I think in general, I, what I found is it, you kind of see what, like the reality I don't, I don't see anything that's too over the top like kind of created um, mm -hmm. i mean I, I try to be as authentic as possible but i i mean i also try to be as succinct as possible and i think that's the difference right like it doesn't help me like if i go off on a tangent in a video i i'm not putting it in these people are going to be like what is what like what are you on yeah like, you're bad i you know we mean, like 
Yeah. I, oh, I, I cut so much audio. Like to the point now where I've started in some instances when I know that I'm going to be like that, I don't even record any audio of me completing the task. And I wait until it's, I'm sitting in studio and I'm like talking to the GoPro because I'm like- It's amazing how fast you get to where you realize you're start, like, cause you're videoing yourself and then you're watching yeah. it later all the time. Yeah. How fast you get to that point that you're, you start to say something on the camera and you go, I'm just going to nope. edit this anyways. So I'm not going to yeah. Um, yes. it's, it's funny because we never go back and watch our lives because right yeah i yeah it would be, the, it would be a disaster i'd be like what were we doing <laughs> <laughs> the one thing i will say though doing the video editing and well doing the video editing it does <laughs> help you uh get better at communicating yeah yes like whatever whether whatever it is whether you get too distracted what like whatever it is that you don't even probably know that you do when you start watching yourself you then become conscious of it because yeah. so i've noticed that with some of our recent videos there's a few little things that we don't do anymore or very rarely like we've actually yeah. stopped doing it and then it's like oh well then you hear it it's like okay now it does sound better now it does it's it's a weird it's a weird positive from it. Yeah, it's funny though because the one thing you can't get away from doing is starting sentences with "so." Oh my I know. Yeah. Oh, we I do that. Or, or Chris is terrible because he does. What's the one you do? Um, no, you do two words together. Uh, mm, something. I don't uh, but I also, or something I also like do that. a lot of breaks because when I'm thinking about something, I get to a certain point and then I stop talking. Yeah, you have to put something I in. Yeah, Whoa. no, I, I have the same thing. Like mine, I, I do a lot of like, as you can see, and I need to stop because it's so redundant because I'm just like, the thing that you can see here <laughs> that I don't need to be talking about. I don't even need to be in this, you know, like, <laughs> like, but it, it, it's things to catch. So when I was younger, I actually had, um, I, I had a pretty bad stutter and I went through speech therapy. So this is something that I, I do know that when I'm getting all amped up and crazy and, you know, excited about loophole or loopholes, um, like rabbit holes and stuff that I need to stop and like record essentially and catch myself in certain points. So, um, ums are another one, you know, like you need to be like, where did the thought go? Let's just hold that here for a second. Um, I think you, you start to, your thinking is, is based on those filler words and breaking up the rhythm of words coming out of your mouth and the things that you're thinking and you're trying to think just a little bit ahead of what you're saying, um, even if it's subconsciously, as soon as you break up the rhythm, because you're like, oh, damn, I need to like remove my inclination to say, um, then you're just lost. You, you just, like, you how throw, does my you brain throw, even you throw work? yourself off you know? and then you're just, you, yeah, you're, you get lost pretty quick. So yeah. it, it is difficult. You got to retrain yourself, I think. The other yeah. thing we've learned to do, I think in the videos after editing for ages is we've learned to talk slower because it makes it a lot easier to cut out the mistakes. Yes. <laughs> yep. Yes. And not talking over each other, but we're pretty And, all, and all the uh, the uh, people still watching our live are getting all the inside tips. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, but recording is good. I mean, like we do that when we're, we're prepping for like trials or tests or anything like that with the dogs, we record everything that's happening so that we can see it because what you think is happening is not at all what's happening. Um, is kind of a universal truth, I think, unfortunately. Uh, this is the human condition. You have one idea and it's just not right. Um, so the recording is helpful for that. I just I I'm really starting to understand how useful it is for the speaking and all that because it is important. And I mean it sounds like it lazy and be like, I don't want to have it like I want this video to have no words. And actually I'm playing around with that now in that new playlist. I'm like, it's kind of refreshing just to be like, I'm not in this video. It's just a bunch of birds and a sunrise, and that's it. And that's fine. Like, you know, so yeah, I'm not paying attention to the comments. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got a couple of consonants that if I get any kind of way that isn't like flat, no emotion, then I know I'm going to have some issue with, and I got to kind of think about it. It's not super conscious anymore, but it is something that I have to, I have to think about. Yeah. That's a good one. Uh, totally. yeah, it's, it's helpful. Yeah, it is. Yeah, or just like breaking and being like, okay, now I'm going to breathe. We we never realized how much 
like right now we're talking fast. That's how we talk. Right. You get excited yeah. and you just talk, 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 and and yeah. you never realize how how much it all ran together, which makes it hard even for people to follow it, right? Because yeah. we know what we're saying and we're trying to get it out so quickly. And yeah, so Except definitely me, teaching. No, you get going, and then it's going. <laughs> you get when you get going into something, and you're. I talk. I always say I talk the dumbed down version because I don't know all the lingo. I don't read the books. Chris is my encyclopedia. I do the dumbed down version of what I've learned from Chris. But Chris gets going, and he does it in a, in the the science type way or biologist way, and then he's still doing it at a speed that sometimes it's really hard to follow because he's jumped from the you know it, it naturally jumps for him from subject to subject yet it's like okay i'm lost i have no idea what's going on yeah. so that's where it's nice when you talk slower to edit the video down to make it a bit more user friendly is that yeah having that ability when my, I, my newest one chrissy is um i've been finding when i start my audio clips my voice cracks and i'm like great that's fun that's exactly what I need. So One I'm not sure what's going on there, but I haven't been editing them out. I'm just like, I guess I'm going through puberty. I don't know what's happening here. So. One thing that impresses me is when people can talk about something and, and it gets complicated and they'll go and they'll go off on a tangent and then a tangent from that tangent and a tangent from the tangent. And then somehow they were like, they notice it's happened and they'll bring it back with a sentence, not just one tangent ago, but all the way back. They have a much better short-term memory than I do because, like, I that's gone. <laughs> There's no way. Yeah. I, might be, I might remember one step back, but I'm not remember four. Yeah, it'll be like, and no. what was I talking about before this? Yeah, but some people have that ability, and they, they can go and and uh, come up with really elaborate, um, you know, arguments about things, and then still bring it back. And I've already I've already forgotten what the question was. And, yeah. uh, and you asked it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know if you're just born with that skill or something you practice, but uh, I don't have it. Some people do. Well, and I, yeah. I think, I mean, oh, and here we go with the tangents, but I, I think a lot of that communication part has got to do with the EQ of a person. And I think a lot of oh, people yeah, who are that. drawn, yeah, like I think a lot <laughs> of people who are drawn to homesteading and solitary lives, kind of the way we are, don't have a high EQ, at least in my experience. Like I, I was gifted a, an emotional intelligence book by a, a manager of mine. I read it and then I, I the, had I questions. I love the gifts that are hints. And Here's yeah, yeah, he was like, you. you need this. <laughs> so I read it and then I started asking questions and he was like, you read the whole thing? And I'm like, yeah. And he was like, you read the EQ book wrong. Like, what am I, how do I, I can't, I can't fix you. Bye. Like it was, it, like, it was bad. I, I don't have, I'm not very good at it. And I think that's why it's interesting that so many of us, maybe not so many, but a lot of us are ending up in this, in the YouTube world where we are communicating and we're like, that's a huge part of what we're doing because I think a lot of us are missing some of those pieces and we don't really know how. So it's fun kind of learning, learning that, you know, and I think at least that's what I struggle with. I'm probably projecting that on every other person. I'm like, well, I, be an I don't know so, the official know. definition of, of EQ. I'm, I'm guessing that it's, well, if IQ is noticing Intelligence is noticing patterns and being able to apply it elsewhere. Then EQ would be noticing patterns in people's behavior, I guess, mm -hmm. and being able to apply that to new situations. Um, yeah. I don't do that. And it's introspective <laughs> as well. To, like it's, But again, I read the book wrong, so I probably shouldn't talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was floored by that. I've never been told I read a book wrong before. I was like, I don't under... But I guess you're supposed to take the quiz, and then you're supposed to go to the thing that applies to you. Uh, kind of like a horoscope. And I just, I just read started reading it, and then I was like, this makes no sense. And then, of course, it didn't make any sense. It, it was like a create your own adventure. You can't just read it, you know, pages one through till the end. <laughs> like, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Right. It's like every We're on a new topic time. again, though. We should probably we yes. should probably wrap it. <laughs> hey, you're almost to tomorrow. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We're, we're we're cutting it close. Oh no. Yeah. Oh no. All right. Well, Thank I think you so much. I think for we did. I don't think we hit everything. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm certain we didn't, but we we hit the big ones. I think. Um, and and, most uh, of it. Yeah. Though those, I'm sure there'll be other things that pop up from time to time, but uh, mm -hmm. we got we got the big the big names. Yeah. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you so much for, I mean, inviting us onto your live and then coming onto ours. That was that was awesome. Oh, yeah. no problem. It was great. Uh, 
know, it's, it's, it, it's been fun. I think it's fantastic. It's kind of like that new pub thing, right? You know, it's like sitting around the pub just talk. Maybe not everybody talks about seed saving at the pub. Don't they get me wrong. Don't. But <laughs> <laughs> there's weird oh, people well. like us out there. <laughs> but yeah. uh, anyways, hopefully uh, between yesterday and today, we've wrestled up a few new viewers for you guys as well. And Yes, uh, yes. We, uh, we went up something by like 20%. From awesome. the beginning awesome. of yesterday's live to the end awesome. of it. No, but we've we've always rounded up our subscriber number to the nearest thousand. <laughs> so it actually hasn't changed. But yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah it's been a, it's, it's, it's it's interesting because like our last um our last channel, I think we hit fifty in a month, and we had two videos and they were garbage. And this time we're like you know plugging away, fighting the good fight and. <laughs> For like thirty, woo, <laughs> you know, and it's uh, it's it's kind of funny. It's I don't know, and and I, I'm I, we're not really concerned about it. Like we're just. I was gonna say the one piece of closing advice I will definitely give on uh, on the video part. At least I, we find it with the homesteading type channel. Just keep making them because that yeah. vlog. It's is... amazing, like the the <clears throat> stuff that gets watched now of our stuff. That I mean, it sat there for a year with nothing. Yeah. Right. And now it's just like like there was one today and it was like it had nothing and then today had 26 views out of <laughs> like I think it doubled what it ever had been viewed in the year and a bit it had been on. Yeah. <laughs> just oh, like yeah. why is that? Why is YouTube like that one today? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So just keep going and oh yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's good because I'm enjoying it. Like I can't imagine stopping at this point, which is good because we need that video editing for our next like big work thing. So this is very valuable, but I mean, I get to test it and learn it. And I mean, it's, it's a lot of fun. Like I'm kind of getting addicted to this. So do you guys think that live streams help to get more subscribers and views on videos? It did for us. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, I think our, our subscribers are probably already subscribed to you. So you're getting nothing out of this. But <laughs> it, uh, no, I don't uh, think so. Cause you had some people that uh, I, I don't think yet that came that, knew you and didn't know us probably knew, probably knew us personally yeah so so that was funny i came back from so i i had a fiddle lesson last night and i came back from it and jack's like so i've told everyone we know and i'm like what what do you mean because i'm like you don't have social media anymore so like what 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 and he was like yeah i like texted and called everybody and i'm like you you did what <laughs> I'm still stuck on this. And then like someone showed up here today for like a training thing and he was like, Yeah, I didn't get on last night, but I'm gonna watch it tonight. And I'm like, him? I'm like, what are you <laughs> what is going on? Um, I'm gonna spread the word. Yeah, so Jack, like old school, like picked up the phone and was like, I'm doing a thing on the internet. And oh yeah. So that was that was fun. I, I'm just more like whatever. People find it, they find it. If not, whatever. Like I just yeah. I, I don't know. I just I, I think uh the, the kind one, of what Chrissy's got there is the one thing I think about the live streams. A la last true closing thought: um, they <laughs> definitely they definitely help with um, <clears throat> your overall views, right? Because it still counts as watch time. Uh, I think they're hard at first, but they build momentum. It's, it's one of those <clears throat> things. I'm going to say it as far as building a channel on live streams. I don't think it's sustainable to actually have growth uh for a homesteading for a channel. homesteading channel because basically what you want to be doing is pumping out content that people are going to type in and say i want to know how to prune my apple trees you know or or whatever that's but, that's what the lives are not talking about doing stuff yeah yeah but exactly. the, but, the, but the lives are nice because then it's exactly it's a chance to get to know people yeah. and they get the yeah. chance yeah. to know you and and which is awesome because that's the part that uh well, really, before we started it, you wouldn't have even thought that YouTube. Would oh be gosh, that way. no, no! I had we, had we were those people that we'd used YouTube for years, and we never subscribed to anybody, never liked anything, never commented. We never even knew about lives on YouTube until we actually decided we were going to do a channel because we follow Living Traditions um, Homestead and a few other the bigger ones. ones at that time, and we were like, "Well, we could do this." <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and it's a great way to document things because we're terrible at keeping records and track of things and stuff. And we've improved since starting YouTube, but it was not that way before. And I think that's the thing is, is you kind of get, 
I, I don't know. I, I love the lives because I love getting to know people. But uh, that's one of the things that we had a really hard time with was using lives to grow a channel because yeah. it just seemed like a lot of work. Like I've seen people mm -hmm. spend hours and hours doing interviews on other people's channels. And the worst thing is YouTube takes those subs away because if people don't watch something, right? Wow. Like you can go, they, 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 they click subscribe, but if they don't watch something, eventually those subscript, those numbers go back down. Right. So that's yeah. where it kind of got one of those things where we just said, you know, we're just going to keep putting out content. It's going to be slow and that's fine. Just the best thing is just do what you enjoy doing. And like you said earlier, kind of be genuine with what yeah. you're doing yeah. because yeah. The, the more you do it, people will see that. Yeah. Oh yeah, exactly. So. And I, I think it doesn't help other people too. I mean, like I would feel badly if someone, if we like did get larger and we had someone who was like, well, I want to do what you do, but what I'm doing isn't who I am. Then I would feel like I'd misled yeah. someone and that I'd like yeah. let them down, you know, this path that, you know, and I, I don't know. Yeah. Like I probably we, think I have more influence than I do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if we say <laughs> no one like, should follow me, we can, we can do this because of our flock of uh, six ducks provides us the income we need to, yeah. uh, to live a full, full and affluent life. Yeah. Um, I mean like that stuff would be like before I always, like we always wanted to stay away from like what we did for a living and like work and like all that, because it was like, it's not relevant. Um, but it's become relevant and it's becoming even more relevant the further we go along. So mm -hmm. we kind of made a decision here about a month ago that we were just going to just be like, this yep. Is yep. Just exactly how it is. And I mean, like sometimes it's not going to be, and that's the thing with homesteading is like to find it. You yeah. can't, you can't, you can't, well, you you can't, can you use the I mean, textbook example. Well, yeah, you've got the textbook about yeah. people that were given land, da, 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 you know, but, yeah, and it just, it's, it's not relevant. I mean, like, I get, like I, people ask, that's probably the number one homesteading question we get for people who aren't homesteading, uh, for people we just know they're like, well, do I have enough land? And I'm like, of course, mm -hmm. of, of course you do. Like the stuff that people can accomplish on a quarter of an acre. Like I've yeah. seen people do, have more productive acreage on a quarter than 50 or a hundred exactly. or, you know, whatever. Like it just, it does not matter. It's yeah. the size does not. I mean, to a certain extent, it probably does. If you live in a hundred square feet, you know, a, a high rise, doing, I mean, like maybe that's going to be harder, but yeah. I mean, generally no, just here, do it. Here's a very important question. Oh no. Do you consider yourself a YouTube homesteader or a homestead YouTuber? I would probably say a homestead YouTuber because we've stuck to, well, I think both of us feel this way that I would never go into things to create content. Yeah. I think it's, a, it's, a, a, a YouTube, a YouTuber that homesteads is more inclined to create or get into something or try a new venture in order to maintain being able to create content. And yeah. I, I don't think that that would ever be. So I, I think we homestead first. The YouTube is just documenting what we do. That doesn't, the, that doesn't mean that we wouldn't do something different in the future, but I, we wouldn't, like you said, it wouldn't be because we need to get more views or what yeah. have you. So, you know, let's get cows because we want more views. Now we already no. tried that. <laughs> cows are already gone. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've um, we've seen some channels and it, it's um, like family vlogs and uh, I swear a couple of them because of the amount of income they're and they're making good money. Oh, you're not going to say. I'm it. not going to say who it is, but they're, like they're, they're making good money, um, and it's become their job, like for the whole oh. family. And I swear they had they had an extra kid because they're like this one's getting old, and we got to. It's we gotta not get, a homestead. We got to get a new. We got to get a new watches. income stream, um, and that's oh, the. Okay. You know, the life yeah. follows the YouTube channel at that point, but well, that's well, the, it, it's possible. It's possible I'm because gonna... you've got to keep things. That's the thing with a vlog, vlog style. I'm going to say instead of yeah. like what Crucy was saying in here about he finds that his how to stuff gets more viewing than other stuff, and that would be one of those things that a vlog you can't end. You yeah. you you, you that's going. people. It's a reality show. You have to produce forever, and it has to stay interesting. Where when you're building how to type content, it's findable in ten years time, and hopefully still relevant. Or you've remade it with the new information you've learned. Yeah, um, so that's and that's I want to go, and we talk about this all the time. Like I want to go in the education direction, and then just like gradually phase myself out of everything, 
and just literally be a hermit here and never see any people. Like that's kind of what I want to do with life in general. Just like make the mark, help the people. And then just, I feel, leave. I feel weird about how to <laughs> stuff. I feel, I don't know at what point I'd, I'd feel like I've done it enough to be like, okay, this is how to. Because like, he thinks there's the, no simple answer in <laughs> lots of gray areas. Yeah, the carbonara. Like I've made that thing enough times and some people don't know how to make it. I, I could give a, a how way. to on it. A way. Um, that's, it's all it. I so mean, I for most of the projects we do, I, I could kind of take it from the, uh, this is how we're doing it. We're looking into it, follow along and see if we mess up. And that's kind of I'm, I'm more I'm more comfortable with that yeah. than yeah. And like, then if, this is the way. If we mess up, like I want to own that. It still it still can be it can still be a how to do that thing, but it's I know what you mean because it's not it's not the typical prescriptive like do this step this step this step and you get to X result right. But like we do, we've got to like the thing. authority also. <clears throat> well, it's <clears throat> like when we did the sugar beets, for example. I don't we we did a video last this time last year february whatever anyways on making our sugar beets into syrup into sugar we'd never yeah. done it before it was purely an experiment we took people from yeah. start to finish and it's our best video and you know we were able to if you're able to show the process and get the result or explain to people why well, it I failed yeah. It's yeah. Full useful information whether you're an expert on it or not you've shown people the journey you took and yeah. what the results yeah, showing how to do it i guess that that's valid yeah, yeah. well and i think yeah. another thing too um is sometimes it's helpful when you've done it some of it before like this yeah. is not you know this is not and this i'm not downplaying anybody who started a channel and has never grown vegetables or had livestock before because that's still valuable but when you've done it before you you, you have experience right and so your yeah. your vlog may be showing people that experience without you even really knowing that you're doing it or thinking mm -hmm. that you're doing it right um yeah and then you get well, into situations was... where people ask questions like oh well i saw you do this and can you do a video like specific about that or whatever and it's stuff yeah. that you haven't even thought about because it's just you do it you're not you may not be an expert but you're just not thinking about it and you just do it all the time and it works or it doesn't yeah. work whatever mm -hmm. Well, that was our first, our first live that we did on this channel was about orchard planning. And I was really, we were both, I think, pretty nervous about doing it. Cause again, like inserting yourself as the authority on it. And eventually we ended up like, we did the live and we explained the things we knew because I mean, in some ways, like, are we professional orchard planners? God, no, but we're on our second orchard at this point. We, we have made a lot of mistakes. We have learned a lot of stuff. And beyond that, we've researched for so many years, like in so many different directions. I mean, it's not a, you know, a conclusive, like, this is how you do this thing. Um, and it's the only way it's just like, this is what we found. And we're going to translate some of those years of knowledge into something that someone can digest enough that they can then go on and do their own research or, or find more people who know stuff. So I, I don't know if we can be a well, gateway I, drug in homesteading. It's riffing off of the, the factors that you'd have to consider. And it's probably yeah. not, <laughs> but it's probably, it's the big ones. Yeah. It's sharing, um, it's sharing the thought process, which is, uh, yeah, still very valuable because that's the part in the homesteading genre and that big umbrella of everything that's under it. That's the broken piece, right? Because that's the, that's yeah, the yeah. generational gap where yeah. a lot of people don't have that. Well, and then oh. when, they, when they talk about, um, you know, well, people used to live this way. So, you know, obviously you can do it. I think in some ways it's almost harder now because you're an island. It's like mm -hmm. if everyone was doing some stuff, then, you know, collectively you're kind of okay. But now if you're an island and you need to have 30 plus chickens to maintain chickens, it's not that you and your community, your whole, you know, block party each has part of the breeding program going on. Well, um, and that's a big thing. It's like what we were stuff. talking about with some of the seeds and vegetables too, right? You would have yeah, had re right. regional variation because exactly it would have been your neighbors and people yeah. close by. Oh, yeah. And, and now that's, that's almost where, as fun as the diversity is, it's also a negative because mm -hmm. if we're all islands and we all start doing different stuff on all of it, I mean, on tomatoes, yeah, you could, but like you said, on chickens, you can, but it's a lot harder yeah. on cows. Forget it. You're not. Yeah, there's no way you can't. So yeah. 
you know, there's the gamut. There are some things, yeah, you can be the island. There's some things that if you don't have to be the island, it would be a lot better. And that's where community is great. But it's also really hard because you have to have a lot of like-minded people doing the same yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I don't and I think a lot of us don't want to depend on other people to that degree. And we don't want to, I mean, like, well, like we're slash we're, can't. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, like if you want to barter and you want that community and you want to build that stuff, I mean, it's really hard to put any piece of your own sustainability into someone else's hands. Like it's, yeah. I really, yeah. yeah. You know, well, that's, I don't like that. to be very blunt, that is one of the big factors of why we don't have cows. Yep. Yeah. Because there's, you, you're completely at the mercy of whatever's going on around you. And that's not, not, not said in a negative way, but you are. But like we are, for eggs, for chicken eggs especially, we're fine with the amount we get out of our, I don't know how many chickens we have, seven? Something more, like that? More than um, chicken math, who knows, less than a dozen. Yeah. So, it, but it's not very many. And um, the amount of eggs we get is fine for our eating, especially when you add the duck eggs into it. Oh, for hatching out for a straight meat run each year, it's more than enough to create the chickens we need in the summer. And, uh, you know, that would be fine. But if we want to keep those Chanticleers going, we got to get that clan system going. And now we got a bigger flock. Now we got all these eggs and we're in the egg business or we're feeding it to a pig or doing something else with it. And it, it, it complicates things. Um, yes. because you have to go a bigger scale than you'd otherwise have to. And that's where it gets hard too, right? Because this is like, for us, the, the idealistic homestead that I think a lot of people want to have is they have a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of it. And then, you know, that's a, that's a pretty common thought process, but you can't. It's the romantic idea as opposed yeah. to the, 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 yeah. the, the reality the, of it is yeah. you really need to, as things get more complicated, you really have to think. Why do I have it? What am I what am I using it for? What's it giving me back? How do I keep it going? And do I really need I'm gonna pick on chickens, right? There's nothing wrong with having multiple breeds of chickens, but in, there is the argument, do you need them? Yeah. There is likely on a, on an actual homestead scale, one breed will pending your goals will probably produce you enough meat and eggs to feed your family. Yep. But then if you start wanting specialty, whether it's egg color for, you know, selling them or maybe a bird that's more of an egg layer versus a meat bird or like when you start breaking it apart that way, it gets more complicated. Well, and if you can rely on being able to get stuff from elsewhere, again, you can do a straight run of, uh, you know, meat chickens and that's going to be pretty efficient. And you can get like really good egg layers that are going to be super efficient and you can be, um, you know, rotating them. You don't even need to have breeders to replenish it. No. You just keep bringing in new ones, um, whatever, at whatever time period makes the most sense, you know, mathematically. I know on chickens, it's, it's, it's not very long. You're supposed to keep them. Um, to no, for the start breed. losing efficiency after like a couple of years. Ducks, I think you get an extra year out of it maybe before it kind of starts dropping off. But then that's uh, what, that's where it becomes different on the measure of what's what your goal. If, yeah. if what it does the means to the end outweigh the other factors, right? If you're once you start trying to be sustainable, it's very different from the put and take. Put and take yeah. is not sustainable <laughs> no matter what, unless you have a lot of people around you that well, you, you put and take is never actually sustainable because somebody has to produce it. Yeah. But that's a much bigger discussion. We yes. should probably not get into that. <laughs> we, 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 we barely, we barely even uh, grabbed hold of this one. We got, we got the big ones out and we got, uh, yeah. <laughs> we, we got, we got a lot in. And now I it's think. tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, it's, <laughs> now it's tomorrow. Just take that. Sorry. We, have, we need to we need to work on controlling our chit chat. No. Yeah, <laughs> it's almost like if we do them earlier, then we're just on for longer. So well, maybe yeah. we have to start at like That's, eleven. It's one of those things that that we just have so much to say, and it's like, well, you just gave us an extra hour. We're yeah. still the same time as yesterday. Yeah, well, yeah. Like, and of course, it, it, is. it it stimulates new ideas, and then a lot of those ideas are. Um, either huge conversations or videos. So I've kind of yeah. save it for later or do it, you know, talk about it now or, or often both, I think. Um, but, oh, yeah. But we, this we, has been great. We should, yeah, we probably should go to bed. Now that so. it's tomorrow. Yeah. I think, I think we should call it. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> it was kind of rough, honestly. Like we, it was noon before we were like really rolling. 
Like it was, <laughs> it took some time, yep. you know, like, you know, kids got herself breakfast and lunch. Like she did it all herself. Yeah, and then we're like getting the work. Pretty free range. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pretty free range child. Um, all right. Well, thank, thanks for coming out and, uh, and having us on your channel and, and yeah. going through this with us. Um, Ooh, been able to pick your brain a bit. And and get through. Uh, well, his brain's a always of, available. A lot of topics. Yeah, got other questions. <laughs> I yeah. feel like we probably doubled our watch hours just from this live. That's it was so that's long, and there were so many people on. It could be. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. All right. Well. All right. Thank you to everybody in the chat too that stuck with yes, us. Yes, thank you guys. Thank you so and much. we appreciate it. And uh, awesome. hope everybody has a fantastic tomorrow. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Today yeah. now. Yeah. For us. <laughs> All right. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. We'll talk to everyone later. <laughs>